Hopefully you did well on today's quiz. Any questions before we get started today? All right, let's talk our game plan. Uh, today we're gonna continue where we left off last one, continuing our stock, talk about nervous physiology, and we will be uh, getting into the action potential uh, today and graded potentials as well. We talked about those a little bit. We have a little bit more to finish on that. We'll also finally get a chance to start our uh, lab, uh, Brain Anatomy. Hopefully you've started looking at that list. We, as I mentioned, we will go through it together. Make sure you understand uh, what you're responsible for on that. Uh, Tuesday, uh, your uh, next assignment is due, Unit 12 Review uh, 13 uh, is due on Thursday. Oh, I, that reminds me. There is one other thing that I wanted to put on there. Thursday the 23rd, so let's go ahead and put this in rank, in red. I think it's going to be Thursday the 23rd. We will double check that. But on Thursday the 23rd, I believe we will be going over the cranial nerves. Uh, again, depending on where we are in the class, depending on how much of the sensory stuff we get to, as much as 20 to 25% of your lab exam is going to be on the cranial nerves. There is a handout on uh, Canvas for you to print out. I don't necessarily expect you to fill it out ahead of time. If you wanna fill it out ahead of time, you can, but we will be going over it together. Uh, but that's going to be a huge lab when we do that because, like I said, it could easily be, depending on how far behind we are, uh, as much as 25% of your lab exams. So it is important to make sure that we understand this information, and there's a lot of it. So make sure you've printed out that handout or at least made your own handout for it because uh, we'll be going over those cranial nerves together on Thursday. Uh, Friday, your uh, last uh, lab simulator is due, and that is your Physio X Exercise 3. I remember there are nine activities for that that you have to complete, so that's nine different lab reports. Uh, on Monday the 27th, your last uh, graded for correctness homework assignment is due, and that is your nervous system review. Uh, again, uh, it should be available today uh, after class, so that, because again, I don't want you working on it yet. The point of it is, emphasizing the relationship between structure, function, and location. So one of the things that you will see in it is there appears to be a fair amount of uh, redundancy in some of the questions, and that is on purpose because I want to relate structure, function, and location. So I may ask you the structure and then ask you for the function, or I may ask you the location and then ask you for the function. Notice if I do that, the answer to the, both those questions is going to be the same answer. Um, but uh, that's on purpose because I want you to understand that relationship between structure, function, and location. So that's the point of that. And again, it will be graded for correctness. Many of the answers are just uh, one or two words, three words. So if you want to just write it on the handout, that's fine. Print out the handout, take a picture of it, that's fine. If you want to do it on a, uh, on, you know, a Word file or something like that, that is fine as well. One more unit review uh, due next week, and that's Tuesday the 14th. And then also, uh, you actually have a lab lab. We haven't had too many of those, but now we're gonna get a chance uh, to play with your reflexes. Uh, most of the activities, and there are, they are procedure two on pages 371 through 374, and procedure two on 380, uh, where you're gonna be checking reflexes. Uh, most of you can do most of these activities, uh, most of you will have a light, if nothing else, you can use the flashlight on your phone or things along those lines. If you don't have a tuning fork or things along those lines, or you don't have someone to play with you know, wherever you are to do those things, then what I want you to do is answer the questions in the form of a thought experiment. What do you believe will happen? Uh, what I don't want is people to write, I couldn't do this activity or just leave a blank because you couldn't do the activity. If you can't do the activity, that is perfectly fine. Many of these activities you should be able to do, especially if you have somebody else in the house with you. Uh, but again, don't grab some random stranger on the street just so you can complete these. If you can't complete them either because you don't have the equipment or you can't complete them for any other reason, that is fine. But answer the questions as a thought experiment. What do you believe would occur? How would you think the results would be along those lines. So again, do not leave answers blank. Uh, do not just write, I don't know, I couldn't do this. Uh, figure it out. So that is an activity that you're going to be doing. Again, you can start on that whenever, but it's not going to be due till Tuesday the 28th. And then that's it. That is it for our lectures. The, the, the rest of that week, Thursday and Friday, are going to be our lab and lecture exam on Thursday and then the final on Friday. And then, uh, then you finally get to rest. 
So that's the game plan. We are rapidly approaching it down to our last two weeks. All right, questions on any of that? Yeah, I do have a question yes. uh, for the final. Yes. Um, are we gonna have, I, I know, you know, it's kind of, maybe I'm just talking for myself, but it's kind of hard to remember all the chapters we had so far, you know, and know exactly what's gonna be on the final. So my question is, is there any um, study guides or, or anything that can help us for the final? Yes, I do have a study guide per se. Uh, it is very vague. Uh, basically what it is, is a list of most of the major concepts that we have covered in this class. Uh, so again, uh, it, is, it is a list to remind you of what uh, some of the concepts that we have covered are going to be. But here's the, the, the simple answer to this is that uh, you are responsible for everything that we've covered in this class. Uh, so what I would so every chapter there's going to be questions on uh, every section. If you think about it, there's basically four main sections to this. Uh, so it'll be divided pretty evenly between those four main uh, uh, concepts. Although there was a lot in the first one, so there may be a little bit more because that's normally two sections that we fuse into one during summer school. Um, but yeah, basically there's going to be you know that we've done. 15 chapters, I guess, or 14 chapters, something along those lines. And there will easily be five or six questions per chapter. That's pretty much how it's going to work out. Uh, it's fairly evenly dis distributed through the information, including this fourth section. So again, stuff that you had on the uh, lab and lecture exam on Thursday is going to be on the final as well. Uh, remember that the final exam is multiple choice questions. Uh, so there's two keys to that. Uh, the one advantage to that is that you don't have to pull the information out of the ether. Uh, you just have to recognize the correct answer. Uh, so that is definitely a benefit that way, where you don't have to pull information out of the ether. You just so the, the entire the entire final is multiple uh, yes, choice. It'll be 100 oh. multiple choice questions. Now, that oh, okay. being said, they're not going to be the same multiple choice questions that you had on the previous exams. Uh, may there be some that are used again? Yes, but the majority of them are new questions that you have not seen before. Uh, so again, it doesn't behoove you to, to try to go back and look at your previous exams or anything along those lines. Uh, and also remember, each exam we've taken only covers a small subset of the information. Just because something wasn't on the uh, lab exam, or, I mean, or the lecture exam when you took the section on the muscles doesn't mean that it won't be on the final exam as well. So you are responsible for all the information. The good news is at least 50% of it easily should be stuff we're using again and again and again, right? Where, what is the most common cation outside of the cell? What is the most common cation inside of the cell, right? These are kind of concepts that we've used again and again and again in this class and easily 50% of the information should be stuff that is, is pretty straightforward like that. Okay, but yeah, I do have a list of topics. Uh, it is not necessarily all inclusive, but it's a good reminder of some of the major concepts. And as we get closer to that, I will post that as well. Okay. But right now I want you working on the nervous system. All right. Questions on any of that? Right, think of it from a math standpoint. Your final exam is 100 points, but uh, the nervous system has both a lecture and lab exam. Uh, the lecture exam is going to be worth 100 points. The lab exam for this one is a little lighter than we had before. My guess is probably somewhere around 65. I don't know, I haven't finished writing it yet. So somewhere around 65, that would be my guess. Uh, so obviously the nervous system is worth more than the final is. So that should be your focus right now. But with them back to back, obviously you do need to be looking ahead, especially starting this weekend. All righty. Questions? Any other questions? That was a great one. Any others? All right, then let's pick up where we left off. We were working last time, oops, and we were, oh, hold on, back, where am I going? This is what I want, oops, sorry. There we go. So we left off last time and we were talking a about, lot about the cell, how it is polarized, uh, and how those electrical forces and chemical forces help ions to move. Again, this is how we get the cell to do work as we talked about. There's really two keys. The cell needs to stay or wants to stay, let's say it that way. At its resting membrane potential.
But again, resting membrane potential doesn't mean that the cell isn't doing any work. There is massive movement of ions into and out of the cell. The key to the resting membrane potential is that there is no net movement. Now, as we also talked about, we have this unequal distribution of ions. And if one sodium comes in and one potassium goes out, our sodium and potassium are closer to being happy. And the cell's membrane potential hasn't changed because one positive thing has entered and one positive thing has left. So how do we maintain that unequal distribution of ions? How do we stop all the sodium from coming in and all the potassium from going out in a one-to-one -one ratio? How do we maintain this unequal distribution of ions so that we can do work when the time comes to do work? Nope, sorry, I don't have my chat window up. Uh, well, remember, so the chemically gated channels are the gated channels that we actually use to do the work. So that is correct. But the way we are going to maintain resting state is by using pumps. Absolutely. has got that. Absolutely. So sodium, potassium, ATPase, and other pumps. Oops, don't want that capital S. And other pumps are going to allow us. But like we said, the sodium, potassium one is definitely the main one. And your textbook had a pretty picture that shows this process. So here, for instance, is a leak channel uh, where potassium is leaking out of the cell. Here is a potassium leak channel, uh, sorry, a sodium leak channel where sodium is leaking in. But then we have our sodium potassium ATPase, that sodium potassium pump that uses ATP to kick the sodium back out and bring the potassium back in. And in that fashion, we can continue to maintain that normal equilibrium, that status. All right. However, we also talked about ions like sodium and potassium. They, like three-year-olds, don't care about the cell, don't care about, you know, sodium doesn't care about potassium or chloride or anything else. All ions care about is themselves. They want to be at equilibrium. And remember, for an ion, again, equilibrium is where there is no net movement of the ion. And that is going to occur when the chemical force and the electrical force are equal and opposite of each other. At that point, there's no net movement of sodium, there's no net movement of potassium, and those would be happy. Now, again, a cell's never gonna get to that point, hopefully, uh, but uh, that doesn't mean that sodium and potassium don't wanna be there. So they really want, so when we open a channel, and that is really the key, when we open a gated channel, our ions will rush to try to reach equilibrium. All right. So again, not a lot of new information here. We talked about it last time and we're layering on things that we've already known as well. But let's talk about these two things. The first thing I wanna talk about are these gated channels. Because we've actually talked about gated channels before. We may not have summed it up in quite this way, but we have absolutely talked about those channels. As we mentioned last time, there are leak channels, which are non-gated and are always open. So ions like sodium and potassium are always coming into and out of the cell, right? And again, this is why we need our pumps, because ions are constantly moving and we need to constantly keep pumping them back where they don't want to go. Oops. There are, if we're gonna do work though, we need to change the movement of those ions, change the permeability, right? That's another important word, permeability. 
permeability is the, uh, let's say it this way, uh, the amount of an ion that can cross a membrane. Right? If there are 100 sodium leak channels, right, then that's a certain amount of sodium that can be coming in. However, if we open up 1,000 sodium gated channels, then a whole lot more sodium is going to be able to move. All right, and so we would be increasing the permeability. Now, there are there go, three main types of gated channels. And believe it or not, we have talked about all three types. Any idea what the three types of gated channels are? What are the keys, right? With a gated channel, remember there is a key that unlocks the door. What are the three different types of gated? Excellent, one of them is chemically gated. Remember we also could use the fancy word ligand gated. And remember with a chemically gated channel, obviously it is a chemical uh, that binds to the receptor and opens the channel. Excellent, I see the other one too. Perfect, perfect, you guys got them all, excellent. Voltage gated. Remember with a voltage gated channel, it is a change in the membrane potential where it gets more positive. Oops, that's still that's positive, right? And that positive, that depolarization opens the gate. Of course, remember, it isn't just any depolarization. We have to depolarize it to a critical point. And what is that critical voltage? What was the fancy name we gave for the critical voltage needed to open a channel? Threshold, perfect. So these cells have a threshold, and at that threshold, they are going to open. And as someone also mentioned, the third type are mechanically gated. Now we never actually use the term mechanically gated channels. But remember when we were talking about our Pacinian corpuscles, those lamellated corpuscles, the one that provide for us that pressure sensation. We said it looks like it has these layers like an onion. And when we squeeze those layers, that opened up the channels and that's what sent a signal to the brain. And that's exactly what happens with a mechanically gated channel. A physical force changes the shape of the membrane. And when it changes the shape of the membrane, that opens up the channels. And then of course, when you remove that pressure, the channel goes back to closed again. So there you go. There we have the pretty words. There we have the definitions of them. So that's definitely useful information. Uh, let's go ahead and clear this and at least look at the pretty words that describe the three different types of channels. But let's actually look at some good illustrations. Well, okay, let's look at some illustrations. We won't necessarily call them good, but these are some basic illustrations that emphasize this point. Here, of course, we have our chemically gated channel. These are the ones like, for instance, we saw on the motor end plate where a chemical like acetylcholine, conveniently enough, needs to come in and bind to it. So notice without that chemical signal, our positively charged cation cannot get through. But when our acetylcholine comes and binds, when it binds, it changes the shape of the channel opening that channel and now ions can flow through. And again, remember the key with one of the keys with these chemically gated channels is the chemical that unlocks the door is not the chemical that passes through it. Right? Acetylcholine is the key that unlocks the door, 
but sodium or potassium or calcium or something like that is the ion or even chloride is the ion that passes through it. So the chemical that unlocks the door is not the chemical that passes through it, right? My key unlocks the door to my house, but then I travel through it. All right, pretty simple and straightforward. Here's our other, next one. Now these are, this is where things get a tiny more complicated. We have to add one extra layer to this type of channel. All right, so let's start simple first. Here we have a channel and these channels really have two activation gates. Basically what they have are these big positively charged proteins that block this. As I mentioned, this is a very simplistic illustration. Your textbook has a much nicer one that I will show you in just a minute. This positively charged protein basically blocks the channel. When the inside of the cell gets positive enough, when it depolarizes to a critical point, and again, since Alex already mentioned it, I won't bother asking it again, that magical point is, of course, what we call threshold. At threshold, that activation gate opens, and now the ions can move through. So notice at this point, this channel is what we would call closed. I know, duh. And this channel is what we would call open. I know again, duh. However, notice there's something new on this illustration we haven't talked about yet. And that is this inactivation gate. Now, like I said, the picture from your textbook is gonna show this a little bit better. But while it just shows it as a swinging door, what this inactivation gate is really a two component protein. One part of it is a long linear protein and the other part of it is a big globular protein. Let's cheat. There you go. Linear protein and a globular protein. These two proteins have very technical terms, names to them. I'm not sure you'll be able to pronounce them, uh, but you can give it a try. Uh, they're referred to as the ball and the chain. Exactly, so very, very complicated names for these proteins. Uh, what happens is that when this channel is in its open state, like we see down here, it's not very stable. And what will actually happen is that ball of the ball and chain, and I'll cheat and draw it halfway here. The ball of the ball and chain will actually, hold on, come on, connect. There we go. Will actually come up here and wedge itself into the channel. Now notice, if this ball wedges itself into the channel, the door is open. But even though the door is open, are any ions going to be able to flow through this channel with that ball wedged in there? No, of course not, right? And so what ends up happening is our channel enters into a third state. It actually has three different states. Well, let's actually be more specific. Some voltage gated channels. Have three states where they can be closed, they can be open, or this state here where the door is open but that ball has wedged itself in there, in which case we say the uh, channel is inactive. All right. So notice, when it is closed, ions cannot flow. When it is open, ions can flow. And when it is inactive, ions can not flow. All right, again, hopefully that makes some semblance of sense. There's one other tiny piece, but vitally important chunk of information we need to add to this. And this is this inactivation. When it is inactive, when that ball is wedged into the channel, 
it can't come out by itself. Whoops, no, hold on. Oh, no, out of control. The ball cannot be moved out on its own. The only way the ball can be removed is when the channel closes. It turns out that when, draw, when our channel closes, when these proteins come down, and again, this drawing doesn't do a nice job of showing it, it is able to pop the ball out. So I won't bother drawing it right here too much, but I will write this out in words first, and then we'll see the pretty picture from your textbook. Once the channel is inactive, let's do it this way. It can not open again. It must close first. Because closing the channel removes the ball. So the only way that we can get this channel to open a second time is if we close the channel first. All right. Again, I know it doesn't make as much sense with this illustration. So let's cheat and jump ahead to the pretty picture in your textbook. Here, if we look at the pretty picture from your textbook, we get a better example of what one of these uh, inactivated voltage gated channels can look like. Here is what the protein looks like, the channel looks like. Notice it has the pore to it. And as I mentioned, here are these two very positively charged. So this has a ton, oops, not that plus sign, a ton of positive charges on it. This one here has a ton of positive charges on them. So when the inside of the cell depolarizes, that activation gate swings open. And when it swings open, now ions can flow through. Like I said, it turns out it's not very stable in the state. So very quickly after it is open, those that have the inactivation gate, and again, this inactivation gate is a globular protein and a chain-like protein, thin protein, a ball and chain. That ball wedges itself into the channel. And the only way to get the ball out is to get these channels to close. When the channel closes, these proteins swing down again. And when they swing down and close the channel, they pop the ball out. And then once the ball is out, then it can be opened again. So this goes from closed to open, from open to inactive, and then it has to go from inactive back to close before we can use it again. If the channel doesn't close, it's going to stay inactivated forever, and it will never be functional again. And that would be a bad thing. But luckily, once it closes, it pops the ball out, and then it can be used a second time. All right, hopefully this picture helps to make more sense of that. Any questions on this one, the voltage-gated channel? Again, we've added this inactivation gate, this ball and chain to it, so that is something a little bit new. But other than that, there really isn't any new information. We know that once you hit that magical point, and of course that magical point is threshold, then that this channel is going to open, those gates swing open. But now we know that some, not all, but some, of our channels, our voltage gated channels have an inactivation gate. All right, questions on that? All right, my favorite stunned silence. So that of course tells me that you guys have mastered this information, understand it completely. So perfect, whoops, did not mean to do that. So let's go ahead and sneak back for a moment. Because if we sneak back for a moment, so I juggle these things around and I clear my board. Ugh, stop it. Then we see our third type of channel, as was mentioned, the mechanically gated channel. Notice with the mechanically gated channel, when we apply a force, to the plasma membrane, that physical force, the plasma membrane. It stretches the plasma membrane, opening those channels and ions can flow. 
Once that pressure is removed, the plasma membrane goes back and the channel closes. So again, really all of this is information we have had before. The only really new piece of information we have added to this is the inactivation gate. But everything else on here is something we have talked about and used already in this class. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. So as we left off talking about last time, as we mentioned, ions want to be at equilibrium. And equilibrium is the uh, when the chemical force and electrical force are equal and opposite. And we spent, like I said, the last half hour of the class in the last class talking about this. And I know everybody's eyes glazed over and it was, you know, confusing and convoluted. But as I also mentioned, here is the take home message. The take home message is that when you open a gated channel, ions will flow through that gated channel to try to get the cell to reach equilibrium. So the only thing we need to know then is what are the equilibrium potentials of our ions. And the two that are gonna be most important to us, the two that we are going to use in our graded potentials and in our action potentials is sodium and potassium. Anybody remember what I said the equilibrium potential of sodium was? The end of last class. There you go, positive 66 millivolts, absolutely 66 millivolts. And as it turns out, the equilibrium potential, I don't remember if we set it for potassium or not. I may have said it, but I definitely, definitely didn't show and explain how it gets there. But the equilibrium potential for potassium is negative 90 millivolts. At, up to this point in this class, there haven't been many numbers you have been responsible for but these are gonna be some numbers that you are going to be responsible for. We're finally reaching that point where we kind of have some numbers we need to know. So if you think about it right now, there are four numbers I have given you that you absolutely positively need to, I don't want that to be orange, black, I need to know for this exam. And I guess the final for that matter. So let's draw us a graph, because this is gonna be a good starting point. Anytime you draw a graph, you definitely need to be able to label it. So time down here, and let's again stick with black, and let's make that a little smaller so uh, we have a little bit more room to play. I don't know if it needs to be that small. There we go. Time on the bottom x-axis, and over here we have our voltage. And there are four important numbers so far that we are going to be responsible for. The first is the resting membrane potential of the cell. And what did we say that was again? It's the resting membrane potential of a cell. Excellent. So let's draw a line and write negative 70 millivolts. Perfect, so that is negative 70 millivolts. That is the first number we absolutely positively need to know. And conveniently enough, we'll grab this and bring it back over here. Excellent. All right. The second number we need to know is the one we just mentioned, and that is the equilibrium potential. of sodium, and what did we say that was again? Positive 66 millivolts, excellent. So we'll put that up here. And again, there's nothing wrong with just writing it 66, but again, since we are dealing with positives and negatives, I like putting the positive there. I certainly wouldn't mark you wrong for just writing 66. However, if you just wrote 70, then obviously that would be wrong. 
us because you definitely need the negative for that one. Excellent. And I just gave you the equilibrium potential of potassium. And what did we say that was again? Negative 90. Excellent. Oops. Oh no. Come back. So that needs to go down here. And I appreciate my bars are not going to be set up at the correct distances from each other, but that's okay. We're going to make this work. Excellent, negative 90 millivolts. So what was the fourth number that I gave you that's gonna be important? Any idea what that fourth number might be? Threshold, there you go, excellent. Threshold. Remind me again what I mean when I say threshold. Threshold for what? Can we be specific in defining what threshold is? Excellent, I like that, that's a great description. When the activation gates open, absolutely. And that's the key, at threshold, all voltage gated, channels, and again, they're in activation gates, are going to open. So threshold is the point when all of our voltage gated channels are going to open. And what did we say that threshold was again? How big of a change? Does anybody remember how big of a change we said it had to be? 10 millivolt change, excellent. So it needs to be a 10 millivolt change, which of course means that it needs to get up here to negative 16 millivolts. So negative 16 millivolts, oops, oops, if I do that correctly, is the point where our, all of our voltage gated channels are going to open. Perfect. So. For starters, those are four numbers that we absolutely positively must know. All right? So there you go. Like I said, up to this point in the class, numbers haven't been that huge of a deal, but here numbers are going to be very, very important. So we are definitely going to talk about numbers and we have this going on here. And it's a little bit sloppy, so let me cheat. Move this down a little bit. Actually, let's move this down there. That down there. That's too. Actually, let's do that. I like that. There. 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 All right, that'll work. Still not accurate, you know, as far as a numerical graph would be, but for our purposes, it will meet our needs. Excellent. So we'll leave this here because we're definitely coming back to this, but let's go back to the lecture and talk about this. So. Ions want to be at equilibrium. When they're at equilibrium, they're going to be happy. So when we open an ion channel, an ion is either going to move into or out of the cell to make the cell what it wants the cell to be. So you open a sodium channel, sodium rushes in because sodium is a positive ion and positive ions entering the cell makes the cell more positive and it's trying to reach its equilibrium potential. If you open a potassium channel, potassium is going to leave the cell. Right, potassium is a positive ion, so when a positive ion leaves the cell, it makes the inside of the cell more negative, and that's what potassium wants. Potassium wants the cell to be more negative. All right, so when ions move, they basically produce a current, right? We've talked about the current when you flip on the light switch. When you flip on that light switch in on the wire in your wall, you have an electron that moves across an ion, uh, across the wire. That electron is a charged particle, and it is moving. And that's all a current is. A current is the movement of a charged particle. 
So when a charged particle like an ion moves into or out of the cell, when it crosses the membrane potential, uh, pardon me, when it crosses the membrane, it produces a current. And that current has a special name. We call it a potential. So in a cell, the flow of ions into or out of the cell produces a current, and that current we call the potential, either a graded potential or an action potential. All right. Questions on that? All right, then let's talk more about our potentials. We talked about them a little bit last time, uh, but here we get to uh, talk about them in more detail. Remember, a graded potential is a small deviation from the resting membrane potential. As uh, we hinted at last time, the average uh, graded potential is somewhere in the order of plus uh, or uh, minus two millivolts. So it is not a very big signal by itself. But there are a couple other keys to our definition of a graded potential. They only occur. Oh, well, let's not say it this way. They occur on the cell body and the dendrite. As I just hinted at, they're small in amplitude. But remember, these also can vary in amplitude. Meaning that it can be slightly larger or slightly smaller in size. Another big key to our greater potentials is they can be positive or they can be negative. So how do we do this? What type of channels would be involved in this type of signal? Well, let's think of it this way. Let's start easy. How can we make a potential uh, either positive or negative? How would it be possible for us to one time make the cell more positive, but the next time we make the cell more negative? How is it that we could do that? Well, as we know, we have to be able to open channels. So how can, if we open a channel, can we make a cell positive? But over here, we open a channel and we make a cell negative. If we have two cells, let's draw two cells. Cell one, cell two. Cell one has a channel, cell two has a channel. If we open this channel, this cell gets more positive. If we open this channel, this cell gets more negative. How can we do that? How could we have one cell get positive and one cell get negative just by opening channels? All right, okay, different channels have different charges, different channels. What needs to be different about the channels? You guys are 100% absolutely correct. But what actually has to be different about these two channels? Well, so does that mean that this one, what if it's acetylcholine that unlocks this one, but it's also acetylcholine that unlocks this one? There we have the same chemical, but this one's positive and this one's negative. How is that? So how does the chemical make a difference? You're half right, but be more specific. What do you mean by chemical? Do you mean the chemical that opens the channel? There you go, the, exactly. So the way we make it positive or negative is by the ion that passes through the channel. Excellent. If a channel makes the cell more positive, what type of channel is it most likely going to be? What kind of channel would we open where we're most likely to make this cell positive on the inside? 
Sodium, absolutely. Are there any other ions we've talked about that if we open that channel would make the cell positive on the inside as well? No, I'm asking the question, so the obvious answer is yes. So what is the other channel that we could open that would make the cell positive on the inside, theoretically? Calcium, absolutely. But remember, calcium makes cells do wonky things. So if our goal is to just make the cell more positive on the inside, are we likely to want to use calcium for that? Probably not. Technically, we could, but calcium gets inside of the cell, all sorts of other wonky things happen. So in most cases, if we want to make the cell positive on the inside, we are going to open up a sodium channel. So absolutely, we will use a sodium channel. Excellent. If, on the other hand, we want to make the cell more negative, what ion could channel could pass would we want to pass through this channel? Potassium, absolutely. Actually, let's go with the abbreviation still. Potassium, because potassium, remember, goes out of the cell, and that positive ion leaving the cell makes the cell more negative. Are there any other ions that are commonly found in and around the cell that might make a channel? There you go, chloride as well, because chloride is gonna wanna come in and that negative ion coming in makes the cell more negative. So if we wanna make the cell more negative on the inside, if we wanna get a negative graded potential, we are typically going to use uh, potassium or chloride channels. Excellent. Good information, good knowledge, that's perfect. All right, so now we've figured out how we can make it more positive or how we can make it more negative. So here's the next question then. How, and let's change colors so that we can tell we're talking about different things. How can we vary the amplitude? How can we make a cell get a lot more positive or a little more positive as a result to opening channels? Okay, so raising the voltage is a decent idea if we think in terms of our voltage gated channels. But remember, as we talked about, once we reach threshold, those voltage gated channels are gonna open like my light switch, it's all or nothing. If I push my light switch twice as hard, does twice as much uh, light come out of my light when I turn it on? Remember, threshold is when all the voltage-gated channels open. So is it possible to open just half of the voltage-gated channels or two-thirds of the voltage-gated channels? No, they're gonna be all or nothing. So are voltage-gated channels gonna allow us to vary the amplitude? No. But let's take it a step further. What if instead this channel, I mean, this, this cell had three channels on it and I sprinkled just the tiniest bit of acetylcholine on here. At that point, maybe if we're lucky, one channel opens and a little bit comes in. But what if I release a little more calcium, uh, pardon me, a little more acetylcholine? then maybe two open, or I open a little bit more, and now three open. Notice by releasing different amounts of neurotransmitter, I can get a different number of uh, channels to open, and the more channels that open, the more sodium that is going to flow. Notice also, I could also have the case where I have three channels, and these are mechanically gated channels. If I push on the plasma membrane just a little bit, that may be enough to open up just one. But if I push a little bigger, I could open up two. And if I push even bigger than that, I can open up even more. So you guys absolutely have the right idea. The way we can vary the amplitude is by the type of channels we use. And for a graded potential, we are gonna use either chemically gated or voltage gated, uh, pardon me, or, uh, or mechanically gated. 
So with those, we can open just a few or we can open a lot. And in that way, we can vary the amplitude of our signal. Let's go back to our illustration from before. All right. Again, what we have is a cell and that cell is happily going to stay at rest for however long we leave it. Now we're not changing the environment around the cell. Well, oh, we are stimulating the cell in some fashion, right? So for instance, if we release a little bit of acetylcholine around this cell, it may open a few sodium channels. And if it opens a few sodium channels, sodium is gonna rush in and we are going to get the cell to depolarize. So I guess we're changing the environment that way by putting in a chemical signal. If we release more, more sodium channels open and we get a bigger signal and more and more as we do it that way. Conversely, if instead of a sodium channel, it opens a potassium channel, then a little bit of a chemical signal gives us a little bit of a negative. And if we open more potassium channels, it gets more negative. And if we release more, it gets more negative. So in this way, we can vary the amplitude, right? We vary the amplitude by the amount of stimulus. Oh, let's see this way, in this case, the amount of chemical uh, signals we release to stimulate the cell. And the more chemical release, the more channels we open. And the more channels we open, the bigger the signal. This is how we're going to vary the amplitude. Of course, we also have fancy words for this. When a cell gets more positive, oops, hold on, I want that to stay back. When a cell gets more positive, how did we refer to a cell that gets more positive? We say the cell does what? Depolarizes. Excellent. Of course, we also know that when it depolarizes, it's not going to stay depolarized forever. Eventually, it is going to go back to its resting membrane potential. So depolarizing is to get more positive than the resting membrane potential. And we also had a fancy name for going back to the resting membrane potential. So let's write this. So depolarizes when it gets more positive than the resting membrane potential. However, when it goes back, excellent. Repolarize this means to go back to the resting membrane potential. But notice also, and I don't remember if this was a term we used. Notice in this case down here, if we open those potassium or if we opened uh, those chloride channels, notice the cell gets more negative than the resting membrane potential. And does anybody know the fancy word we use for that? There you go, excellent. We say that in this case, the cell hyperpolarizes, gets more negative than it would be at rest. But again, it's not gonna stay hyperpolarized forever, eventually it'll come back. And anybody know the term we use for going back to the resting membrane potential? If only there was a term for going back to the resting membrane potential. Do we have a term for that? Is there a term for going back to the resting membrane potential? There you go, exactly. <laughs> there you go. So once again, whether you depolarize or hyperpolarize, when you go back to the resting membrane potential, we still call it a repolarization. There you go. All right. 
again, I've tried to draw this, but let's take a look at the pretty pictures from a textbook. So again, graded potentials are small deviations in the resting membrane potential. They occur in the dendrites in the cell body. They can vary in amplitude and they can depolarize or they can hyperpolarize. They can get more positive or they can get less positive. The way they can do this is by opening different types of channels. Again, to depolarize, typically we are going to use sodium. And to hyperpolarize, typically we are going to use potassium or chloride. They can vary in amplitude because remember, we are going to use chemically gated or mechanically gated. channels. So we can open a few of them or we can open a lot of them. But remember these on average are about uh, plus or minus to millivolts of change. Thank you. As you can see the maid came in and she's taking care of things. Um, <laughs> um, uh, See, you distracted me now. I don't know what I was talking about. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, these graded potentials are relatively small, uh, either plus or minus two millivolts of change. And uh, because of that, they're small. Again, we use the example of making these waves in the pool. As we continue to talk about electricity moves very, very similarly to water. And if I stand at the edge of the pool and I just slap the water, I can produce a little bit of waves. But if I have this big, huge, massive Olympic sized pool in my backyard, if I just slap the surface, is that wave gonna necessarily make it all the way across the distance of that Olympic sized pool? No, of course not. So the uh, problem, if there is a problem with these graded potentials, or at least a limitation of them, is that they can only travel for short distances. All right. Questions on that? All right, so they can only travel short distances, but that's okay because we only need them to reach the axon hillock. Because remember the axon hillock is where we have the trigger zone. And at that trigger zone is where we can produce our action potential. And that's going to be the goal. All right, questions on graded potentials. All right, excellent. With that then, we have set the stage and we are ready for the action potential. As I mentioned, the action potential is probably our most elaborate physiological process we're gonna handle in this class. And again, the good news is it's still, as long as you go step by step and think of the immediate effects of them, everything is going to be okay. Uh, but uh, this is a good natural stopping point. So let's go ahead and take our first break here. Uh, we will come back at, so let's go ahead and clear. Let's, really, let's go back to this one. Uh, we will go ahead and take our, like I said, our first break here. We'll take a 15 minute break. It is 9.08 now. So we will restart. 36, uh, make it bright at, uh, well, it's 9.09 now, so let's do it at uh, 9.24, 25, that works. Let's restart, and then I will start the recording at that point. All right, any questions before we take our break? All right, see you in uh, 15 minutes. All righty, so we are on to the almighty action potential. As I've mentioned before, when we talked about it at first, this, unlike the uh, graded potentials, is a very large signal, a big positive signal. 
And again, we talked about it basically being a 100 millivolt change. So dramatically, dramatically bigger than what we see in the uh, graded potentials. It only occurs in the axons. That should tell us something. That means that our axon are sometimes somehow specialized. We already know that our axon has a special uh, plasma membrane. This is too big. Let's change that. And uh, anyone remember what we called that special plasma membrane for the axon? Axolemma, excellent. Yeah, the axolemma. We didn't say what was special about it, but now we can start to infer what might be special about it. And it really comes from this part right here. It has a set amplitude. Remember, as we talked about, it is a all or nothing signal. You can't have half of an action potentials or three quarters of an action potentials or one and a half times an action potential, right? It's like being pregnant. You either are or you are not. It's like the light switch on the wall. It is on or it is off, right? There is no in between. The reason for that is what makes our axolemma so special is it has massive numbers of voltage gated channels. Remember our plasma membrane of our cell body and our dendrites, we just finished talking about have chemically gated, mechanically gated channels. That's what allows us to produce small variable amplitude types of signals. But here on the axon, we have massive number of voltage gated channels. And in particular, there are two main types of voltage gated channels. Those two main types are voltage gated uh, sodium channels. And we also have voltage gated potassium channels. Two main types, but there are some key differences, really three key differences. Uh, what is the obvious difference? What do you think the biggest difference between a sodium channel and a potassium channel is? Come on, I'm lobbing up the softballs for you here. What do you think a big difference between a sodium channel and a potassium channel is? Yeah, one lets sodium through and the other lets potassium through. You guys have the right idea, the charge obviously and things along those lines, but the most obvious difference is sodium channel allows sodium to flow. It's abbreviated now. Flow through. Whereas obviously a potassium channel allows potassium to flow. Now, you are correct in that also the directions they're gonna flow are gonna be opposite. Sodium flows which way? Into a cell or out of a cell? Into the cell. Whereas potassium flows out of the cell. Excellent. So that is one big difference between the two. The second big difference is the speed. of the channel. Potassium channels open and close very fast. Whereas potassium channels, the voltage of potassium channels, open and close very slow, very slow. Let's be quickly. Fastly, I don't think it's a word, so we'll go with very quickly. Whereas our 
potassium channels open and close very slowly. The other big difference is that inactivation gate. Okay. Oops. Sodium channels have the ball and chain. And since, since they have the ball and chain, they can inactivate. Whereas our potassium jam channels do not have, I'm just gonna abbreviate it here, the ball and chain. So they can not inactivate. I need to cheat because I'm going to need a little bit more room. So let's move all this stuff up. That goes there, that goes there, that goes there, and that goes there. So if you think about it, our sodium channel has three states. It can be open, it can be closed, or it can be inactive. Whereas our potassium channel has two states. It can be open or it can be closed. All right. Questions on that? All right, so this is our starting point. Oops. One last concept that we need to talk about our action potential, but we're not going to do it right now. Is that obviously by making a big wave, it can travel far distances. But even if I take, you know, my little, uh, what are those are tiny cars, little Fiat, I pick up a Fiat and throw it into one end of the pool. I'm going to produce a massive wave and that massive wave is going to spread down my Olympic sized pool. But even that something as big as that, uh, that fiat may not make a wave that makes it all the way to the other end of the pool. Right? It probably will, but it won't. Uh, it might not. And remember we talked about an axon has to be able to carry a signal all the way from here to Seattle, Washington. Remember we could talk to grandma on that axon as well. So not only do we need this action potential to be able to travel long distances, but we need it to basically what, uh, what the term we will use for this is, we will say we need it to self-strengthen. Basically, it needs to continue to get big as it goes, or what we can also say is a self-propagation so that it can go basically infinite distances. It could go, you could produce an action potential that would be able to go all the way from here to Seattle, Washington, and once we produce one action potential, we'll see how we can travel it basically to infinity in its, uh, in its propagation. All right, questions on that? All right, like we've done with all of our big physiological processes, I want to start by drawing it for you first. I need to get rid of most of this stuff but I want to keep my graph because it is going to be convenient for us. Like we did with our muscle contraction, one of the keys to your success on this is by making sure you have every step of the process. Again, I've, I've mostly finished the lab exams. I've only looked at a couple of the lecture exams, but even still, even though I've only looked at a couple, uh, I'll answer that question in just a second. Uh, opened, a, um, I looked at a couple of the lecture exams. Some of you are still missing steps in the process. So make sure you are uh, using uh, and talking about the steps carefully. Uh, when going through this. So yes, uh, as Adina pointed out, the potassium channels are the ones that open slow. Uh, sodium channels are the ones that open uh, fast. And again, both open and close. So let me say that again. Sodium channels open and close quickly. Potassium channels open and close slowly. 
All right. So we have a cell. I'm going to use blue for this. This works. At its resting membrane potential. And again, as we've talked about, we are going to leave this cell at its resting membrane potential forever if we leave it alone. But we want this cell to do work. So the first thing we have to do is we need to disturb the cell. We need to stimulate the cell. The way we stimulate that cell is going to be somewhere out on the cell body and the dendrites. And remember, as we mentioned, we are going to produce a graded potential. And we are going to do that by opening chemically gated and or mechanically gated channels. When we do that, we are going to get a positive signal and a little depolarization. These are small, tiny signals that we're measuring. Ah, oh, we should talk about where we're measuring this too. Let's go back. Um, I could sneak this in over here on the side. Let's do this. That there, that there. Let's draw a neuron again. So here is our neuron. And oops, hold on. Let's make that anatomy in black. Here's our neuron. That neuron, as we know, has dendrites. And then it feeds into an axon hillock, and that axon hillock travels down the axon till it ultimately branches to our synaptic end bulbs. Excellent, there's our typical neuron. Remember our goal to produce an action potential has to occur here in our axon hillock. So remember there in our axon hillock, somewhere in there, whoops, that one is our trigger zone. And that's what we're measuring. So basically we have our voltmeter connected. Oops, hold on. Oh, that's to be blue. Our voltmeter connected here and we're measuring our voltages at this point. So here at our axon hillock, we're measuring our voltage. And again, when the cell is at rest, it's at negative 70 millivolts. So that is our starting point. But then what we do out here somewhere on like a cell body or on the dendrite, we produce a graded potential. That greater potential is a small positive signal that spreads to the axon hillock. And as it spreads to the axon hillock, we measure a change in the membrane potential. And of course, if this change of the membrane potential is small, so and, it's, and it doesn't last for very long, so it is just as easily then going to go away again. Or maybe we produce a slightly bigger one. where it gets a little bit more positive, and then again, eventually goes away. Or even worse, we could be opening potassium channels or chloride channels, in which case the cell gets more negative. And again, nothing special ever happens. If we want something special to happen, what needs to occur is we have to have a graded potential that is big enough to get us to some critical point. And what might that critical point be?
What do you think the critical point we have to get to? There you go, threshold. What we need is a graded potential that is big enough to reach the trigger zone to threshold. And if we can reach threshold, as we know, that is when the magic happens. So let's do this. And let's go ahead and use the light. So here is our threshold. That is that magic point, and we have reached threshold. Now is when the magic is going to happen. All right. Now, remember, at threshold, all of our voltage gated channels are going to open. But as we just finished talking about, are all of our voltage gated channels going to open at the same time? Well, I'm asking the question, so the obvious answer is no. Excellent. Which voltage gated channels open first? Excellent. So again, let's write this out. At threshold, all voltage gated, and since I have voltage gated written over there to the side, I'm going to abbreviate it here. All voltage gated channels start to open, but not all open at the same rate. Our voltage gated sodium channels open quickly. And remember, one of the things that we said about the plasma membrane of our axon is it has a massive number of these. So lots of them open. And if lots of our voltage gated sodium channels open, what's going to happen? What happens when you open a voltage get it? Well, you're right, but you guys skipped a step. Absolutely, when lots of them open, then that means a massive amount of sodium is going to enter the cell. So lots of them open, so a massive amount of sodium enters the cell, but you guys are right about the next step, that massive influx of sodium causes a massive depolarization. All right. In fact, it produces a massive rapid depolarization. Essentially, what we are producing is a big positive signal. This occurs, let's say it this way, because sodium is trying to reach its equilibrium potential, and I'm just going to abbreviate that EP because I've got equilibrium potential written up there to the side. So this occurs because uh, sodium is trying to reach its equilibrium potential, and it produces a big positive signal. Well, if you think about it, a big positive signal is what we've called an action potential. So right here, boom, we've produced our action potential. Excellent. End of story. We are done. Go home, take the rest of the day off. Okay, maybe not. But we have, do have our big positive signal. We have produced our action potential. However, as we have hinted at, when we're going to move by our body through space, like with muscles, do we usually just use one neural action potential to produce one muscle action potential to produce one twitch, and that's how you move your body through space? No, of course not. When we produce action potentials, when we're communicating to other cells, typically we need to produce more than one action potential. So while this has accomplished our goal of producing a big positive signal, what we still have to do is get this cell ready to produce a second action potential. So while we have our big positive signal, right, mission accomplished, 
we still have to continue through this and get it back to its resting state. And it's because once it's back at the resting state, then it can be used again. All righty, but so far so good. We have our big positive signal as the cell is racing towards the equilibrium potential of sodium. So the cell races towards the equilibrium potential of sodium. But doesn't get there. The reason it doesn't get there is two things occur. Two things occur that stop it from reaching its equilibrium potential of sodium. The first thing that happens is our voltage gated sodium channels inactivate. Remember, as we talked about, that ball and chain is going to wedge itself into the channel. And if it wedges itself into the channel, uh, I hate doing one and two when describing these things because it's not like these are sequential. These are occurring together. So I'll tell you what, we'll just put a dash there to emphasize the two steps. So dash dash, voltage gated sodium channels inactivate, the ball and chain wedges itself into the channel. And if it wedges itself into the channel, no new sodium can enter the cell. So it stops getting positive, or more specifically, stops depolarizing. But if that was the case, then it would just stay up here, depolarized forever. And that's not what happens. Instead, a second event occurs as well. And that second event that occurs at the same time, two things occur, maybe we should write that at the same time. The second thing that occurs, oops, so now I'm gonna cheat and delete that so I can do it again. The second thing that occurs is those slow voltage gated potassium channels have finally opened. Again, remember they started way back when we passed threshold but now they are finally going to open. And again, there is a massive number of these. There's a lot of potassium inside the cell, so its concentration gradient wants it to go out. Notice also the inside of the cell is positive. Does potassium like being where it's positive? No. So what's gonna happen is we get a massive efflux of potassium out of the cell. And if we have a massive movement of potassium out of the cell, what happens to the cell? Right, the cell gets more negative. And you are right, the fancy word we have said for that is the cell starts to repolarize. and the cell starts to repolarize. So what ends up happening is we reach a peak, there is no more sodium coming in, it stops getting positive, and then potassium starts to leave, and we get this rapid movement of potassium out, this rapid repolarization as well. Notice the cell does not truly get to the equilibrium potential of sodium, instead, peaks, so the peak is actually about positive 30 millivolts. But if you think about it, as we mentioned before, we are starting at negative 70. We have got to positive 30. How big of a change is that? Negative 70 to positive 30 is a 100 millivolt change, which is what we said we were going to get. We get a positive 100 
millivolt change. Excellent. All right. Now, notice two more things. Notice we said that potassium is going to repolarize the cell get the cell back to its resting membrane potential. But is that really where potassium wants to be? Does potassium want to be at its resting membrane potential? These are easy questions, folks. No, it wants to be at its equilibrium potential. So what's gonna happen is it's gonna hit the resting membrane potential and it's gonna keep on going. You know, let's cheat, draw another line. We'll do this in pink. Our resting membrane potential. Do, 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 that way, like that. That's horrible. Let's do this as a straight line. There we go. Nope, I don't like that either. Hold on. I want that. Oh, I see. That's the problem. Okay, never mind. We'll do a line. There you go. That's our resting potential. And again, let's go ahead and finish our threshold as well. Do, do, do. So we can extend those out. All right, excellent. So notice it's repolarizing it, but the key here is potassium wants to reach its equilibrium potential. And so because of that, what happens is it is going to repolarize this cell and then also take it past hyperpolarize the cell as it tries to reach negative 90 millivolts. This hyperpolarization that occurs this hyperpolarization that occurs, we actually call the undershoot. Where the cell goes past the resting membrane potential towards the equilibrium potential of potassium. All right. So far, so good? All right, but notice the resting membrane potential is not the only thing we passed on the way down. On the way down, the cell passes the threshold oops, for our voltage gated channels. And what happens when we pass the threshold on the way down? All of our voltage gated channels are gonna do what? Start to close. Of course, do they close at the same rate? No, oh, our voltage gated sodium channels close immediately, basically, at that point when it passes threshold. However, it takes a little bit of time for our voltage gated potassium channels to finally close. So the reason we get that undershoot is even though we're passing threshold on the way down, there is a delay in the close of our voltage gated potassium channels. But eventually our voltage gated potassium channels are gonna close. Now all of our voltage gated channels are closed. And the cell will use pumps to bring to, let's say this way, to repolarize the cell back to rest, to 
resting membrane potential. So we get this repolarization as the cell is going to, oops, not big enough. There we go. This repolarization as the cell is finally brought back to rest. Horrible. And there you go. Just that simply, we have described an action potential. All right, questions on this. Let's go through it two more times. First tier, again, we start with the cell, the neuron is at rest. We're measuring in the trigger zone and the cell is happily staying at its resting membrane potential until we disturb it. And that disturbance is from a stimulus. We produce a graded potential out here on the cell body and the dendrites, and that graded potential spreads, that tiny wave spreads to the trigger zone. If it's too small, nothing happens. The cell gets a little depolarized and then it goes back to rest, nothing changes. But if the graded potential is big enough, and that is the key, if it is big enough to reach threshold, then that is when the magic happens. That is that all or nothing point. If you don't reach threshold, you don't get an action potential. If you reach threshold, you get an action potential. That's our all or nothing point. Because when you reach threshold, all, of our voltage gated channels are going to open. But they don't all open at the same time. The voltage gated sodium channels open immediately. And there is a massive number of them. So we get a massive influx of sodium and a massive amount of positive ions entering into the cell gives us a big, huge, massive positive signal. We have produced our action potential. And again, this is occurring because sodium is trying to reach. Yes, I will take a picture of this. Uh, it is I'm not done drawing on it though, so I will. Actually, though, you're right. I will take a picture of this, then we'll take a picture of the next one as well. It is trying to reach its equilibrium potential. So massive amount of sodium is rushing in, and we get this massive depolarization. All right. Now. It wants to reach the equilibrium potential of, of sodium, positive 66 millivolts, but it doesn't get there. And the reason it doesn't get there is two things occur. One of the things occur is that finally our volts, well, again, I, I keep saying them in the same order, but again, this isn't sequential. These two events are occurring at the same time. Okay, our voltage gated sodium channels inactivate, that ball of the ball and chain wedges itself into the channel, so no new sodium can enter the cell. No, it never reaches the equilibrium potential of sodium at the top because our channels inactivate. So not enough sodium can come in to get it up there. New sodium stops coming in, it stops depolarizing. But it doesn't just stay depolarized forever because the second thing that occurs, the second thing that occurs is our slow voltage, voltage gated potassium channels have finally opened. And now we get a massive efflux of sodium, pardon me, of potassium out of the cell. Massive, massive amounts of potassium leave the cell. Positive ion leaving the cell makes the cell more negative. So it gets close. Remember, we said the peak is about positive 30 millivolts, but it is never going to reach the equilibrium potential. It never gets to positive 66 millivolts. Now, Potassium leaving the cell is going to depolar, uh, pardon me, it repolarize the cell, but that's not really its goal. Potassium's goal is to reach its equilibrium potential. So not only does it repolarize the cell, but it hyperpolarizes the cell, taking it past the resting membrane potential, trying to reach its equilibrium potential, a period we call the undershoot. However, it's not going to reach its equilibrium potential either, because on the way down, we pass threshold. 
And when we pass threshold, this is when passing threshold on the way down is when all of our voltage gated channels are gonna close. Voltage gated sodium channels close immediately. And then with a little bit of a delay, our voltage gated potassium channels close. So it never reaches its equilibrium potential either. Of course, it doesn't stay hyperpolarized forever because the cell doesn't want to be there. All the channels are closed, so now our cell can use its pumps, can use its other channels and transporters to bring the cell back to its resting membrane potential. And let's look at this one more way as well. The pretty picture is from your textbook. Notice your pretty picture from your textbook really does a nice job of emphasizing our two channels. Notice when the cell is at its resting membrane potential at negative 70 millivolts. We have two different types of channels here, a sodium channel, which obviously lets sodium pass through it, a potassium channel that obviously lets potassium through it. Both are voltage gated channels, so notice both have those activation gates. But notice our sodium channel has that ball and chain. It has the inactivation gate that our potassium channel doesn't. So when the cell is at rest, it's at negative 70 millivolts, and both our voltage-gated sodium and our voltage-gated potassium channels are closed. All right. Then we reach threshold. We produce a graded potential. And that graded potential is big enough to reach threshold. At threshold, all of our voltage gated channels open, do, but do both of them open at the same time? No. Which one opens first? Sodium, excellent. At threshold, all the channels open, but they open at different rates. The one that opens first is our sodium channel. All of the voltage-gated sodium channels open, and there are massive amounts of them. So we get a massive movement of sodium into the cell because it's trying to reach its equilibrium potential. And we get our big positive signal, our rapid depolarization, our action potential. This was our goal to produce a big positive signal, and this is, we have accomplished that. The very first step, well, really second step, I guess. We had to reach threshold first. It gets close to its equilibrium potential, but it doesn't actually reach there because two things happen. Again, these two things occur at the same time. We're just describing them sequentially. Our ball of the ball and chain wedges itself into the channel, and notice, even though the door is open, Sodium can't pass through it. This is that inactive state. And at the same time, our voltage-gated potassium channels open. And when our voltage-gated potassium channels open, we get a massive efflux of potassium leaving the cell. So no positive ions are coming in anymore. Lots of positive ions are leaving the cell. The cell is getting more negative the cell repolarizes. Of course, remember the goal isn't just to repolarize. Potassium wants to reach its equilibrium potential. So it is going to undershoot. Oops, there it is. There we go. Hold on. Hyperpolarizes, it causes that undershoot to occur. But remember, on the way down, we pass threshold. At threshold, all of our voltage-gated channels close, sodium first, and notice, when sodium's channel closes, it finally pops that inactivation gate out. So once it closes, it can be open again. The only way to open the channel a second time, I'm gonna go back on pictures. Once it's inactivated, the only way to open this channel again is to close the channel first. This is kind of funner to do in the classroom. In the classroom, I open up the lab door and what I do is we have this big, large red garbage can and I shove the big red garbage can into the doorway. And even though the door is open, none of us can travel through that door because that garbage can is there. 
Of course, when I close the door, it shoves the garbage can out of the way. And once the garbage can is shoved out of the way, then the door can be opened again and we are able to pass through that door. And so that's what happens here. Here the ball is wedged in, but when it closes, it kicks the ball out. And so now it is capable of opening again. And that is the key. Let's actually write that on the screen. Here at this point, the channel is not capable of opening again. However, when that ball kicks it out, then suddenly the channel is capable of opening again. Notice it isn't open, but now it's capable of opening again, where before it was not. All right, hopefully I've beaten that dead horse enough. And obviously if I've beaten that dead horse, that should tell you there's an important reason why I'm beating that dead horse. Not that beating dead horses isn't fun, but usually there needs to be an important reason for it. All right, now, again, remember our voltage-gated sodium channels close right away at threshold, but there is a delay with the closing of the potassium channels. That's why we get that undershoot. That's why we get that hyperpolarization. But eventually with a delay, it's going to close, and then our pumps are going to be able to return the cell to its resting membrane potential. All right, questions on that? All right, one more way of thinking of this. I like this picture from your textbook. It shows the action potentials during the part. Although I like to, if you noticed on my illustration, I really like to emphasize the graded potential that brings it to threshold as being something different than what causes the action potential, whereas it kind of shows it more continuously here. Uh, and again, nitpicky artistic stuff. But the picture that I really like is this one. Again, this can be a teeny bit confusing when you first look at it, but if we spend a little time with it, we can make some sense of it. Obviously, the one that's here in purple or pink, we see the action potential. We get the depolarization to threshold, we get the rapid depolarization, we get the repolarization, we get the hyper, uh, the hyperpolarization, the undershoot, back to rest. That's what we've been talking about again and again. What they've done here though in orange and green is shown the permeability of our channels. Again, notice at first when we reach threshold, all of our voltage gated channels open, but notice it's the sodium ones that open first. So we have a massive number of sodium channels opening. So we have a massive increase in the permeability of sodium as a massive amount of sodium can come in. But notice also just as rapidly those sodium channels inactivate. And as soon as that ball wedges itself in there, sodium can't go through it anymore. And so just as quickly all those sodium channels inactivate, no more sodium comes in and the permeability of sodium goes back down. Question? Yes. What makes the sodium channels um, uh, uh, inactivate? Uh, inactivate, like uh, it's not because of the potassium, correct? No, it's not because of the potassium, it's because of that ball and chain. And that's actually a great question and, and a question that many neuroscientists had as well. So what they, what they did and what they found out is actually really clever. As we know, molecules have kinetic energy and move around. So molecules are just randomly moving around inside the cell. So they were curious, is the ball just randomly moving around and it wedges itself in there or is there a purpose to it? So what they actually did, and again, this is where some of these neuroscientists are really brilliant, and they study these things at such different levels. There are individuals who have studied the molecular composition of this channel and this channel only for their entire lives. And what they were able to do is they were actually able to change the length of the chain protein. They could make the chain protein longer or shorter. And if you think about it, with a shorter chain, the ball can't move around as much, whereas with a longer chain, the ball can move all over the place. And that's what they found. It was just the kinetic movement of the ball. With a shorter chain, 
and the ball could move less, it more rapidly wedged itself in the hole. With a longer chain, it moved much more randomly, much more widely in its movement, and it took it much longer before it wedged itself. So it's really just the random kinetic movement of that ball that ultimately leads to it wedging itself in. Okay, so there's no, there's nothing that attracts the ball to start going inside. Nope, it's just the random kinetic energy of it. That's all okay. it is. Yep. Notice also this shows us the permeability of potassium as well. Remember, those potassium channels also open when we reach threshold. But notice they're much slower to open. And because they're slower to open, the permeability goes up much, much slower. In fact, notice they reach its peak just about the time we hit threshold coming back down and they start to close again. Of course, again, they're much slower to close. So again, there is a delay in their closing and that delay in closing is what causes the undershoot to occur because they're open for a prolonged period of time till they finally close. So I, I like this channel because it really shows the differences in the speed of the opening and the closing of the sodium channels and the potassium channels. All right, questions on that? Yeah, quick question. Since yep. um, potassium doesn't have the ball and chain, what makes it close before reaching its potential? The fact that it passed threshold. When it passes threshold oh. on the way down, it starts to close. Gotcha. This doesn't close instantaneously. All right. Great question. Any others? All right. I'm going to cheat and come back to, oh, no, I want this picture. I want this picture because this is going to bring us to, okay, so let's stop there. We have described an action potential end of story from start to finish, from resting memory potential back to resting memory potential. If I ask you to describe the events that occur in the production of an action potential, we have answered that question. All right. That's your essay question. The production of an action potential, we have described and identified that process. Kind of like on the last test, we described the process of a twitch. But as we also talked about in the last class, we typically don't move our body in space with just one twitch. So it was important to know not just how we make one twitch, but how and when we can make a second twitch, All right? That was an equally important thing to know. Well, the same thing is true here. What we have talked about so far is the production of an action potential, but typically when a neuron communicates with its target cell, by producing multiple action potentials. So not only do we need to know how to make one action potential, which we've done, but the other thing we need to do know is how, or more specifically, when we can make a second action potential. Because it turns out that as we've been talking, uh, we said that neurons and muscle cells shared some characteristics. They are both uh, irritable, right? They both have conductivity, things along those lines. But another way that they are similar is that after stimulated, there is a brief period of time where the cell can not be excited again. Do you remember what we called that with our muscle cells? What did we call that period of time, that brief period of time where a muscle cell lost its irritability? There you go, a refractory period. We didn't explain where it came from before, 
but now we will. So let's describe where that refractory period comes from. To do that, we need to understand a couple things. What event occurs to produce the action potential? What event occurs that produces our action potential? Our action potential is a big positive signal. What is the event that occurs that produces the big positive signal? Come on, what gives us our big positive signal? You guys are overthinking this. What makes the big positive signal? What makes the cell positive? You guys are gonna make me switch from coffee to vodka. There you go, sodium channels open. And not just only so any sodium channels, but voltage gated. Voltage gated sodium channels open. So when a voltage gated sodium channel opens, we get an action potential. We comfortable with that definition? That makes sense? When a sodium channel opens, voltage, uh, we get an action potential. All right. Now, kind of in a similar way that instead of opening a channel, I can open a window. My window's open. My voltage gated sodium channel is open. I need to open a window to get an action potential. I open my window, I get an action potential. But now I have a problem. My window's open. If I open my window again, does that even make sense? Can I open my window again? Can I get a second action potential if the channel is already open? If once you've opened a door, can you open it a second time? It's not your question. Once you open a window, can you open that window a second time? No, absolutely not. And that's the problem we have. So if you think about it, let's draw on top of our illustration here with a highlighter. Um, right here, when we reach threshold, our voltage gated sodium channel opens. And if our voltage gated sodium channel opens, we can't open it a second time. And if we can't open it a second time, we can't get a second action potential. It's almost too obvious of a definition of a description, right? But hopefully it makes some semblance of sense. At this point right here, our voltage gated sodium channels open and once they're open, we can't get them to open a second time. It's impossible. What do we have to do to get them to open a second time? Well, let's think about it. What happens to those voltage gated channels right here? What happens to the voltage gated sodium channels right here at this point? They inactivate? Yeah. At this point, our voltage gated channels inactivate. If they're inactive, can we get sodium to pass through them a second time? Can we open them again? And if we can't open them again, oops, oops, if I spell it right. Again, we still can't get a second action potential. So all the way through here to here, can't get a second action potential. All right, what do we need to do to get these voltage gated sodium channels to open a second time? If I want to open that window a second time, what do I have to do first? Close it, exactly. And where do I close it? 
How do I close my voltage gated sodium channel? True, I need to get rid of that ball and chain, but how do I close it? What causes the voltage gated sodium channel to close? Repolarize it to what point? Is it passing the threshold? Exactly what it is, passing threshold. So notice at this point right here, so from here all the way up through here, all the way down through here, notice at this point from here to here, right, our channel is either open or inactive. At this point here, you guys are right. Finally, our voltage-gated sodium channel closes. And once it closes, once closed, it can be opened again. All right? So notice, from these periods of time, and I'll emphasize it for, again, from the point where it passes threshold and it opens, through the point where it inactivates, all the way down to threshold where it closes again. During this period of time, there is absolutely positively nothing you can do to get this cell to open a second time. And so this period of time is what we refer to as the absolute refractory period. Oops. Because there is absolutely positively nothing we can do to the cell to get it to produce a second action potential at this period of time. Because once the door is open, it can't be opened again. All right, with me so far? All right, the good news then, the good news then is that at this point here, and let's switch colors to, uh, we'll use orange. Then at this point here, once our voltage gated sodium channels close, they can be opened again but we still have a problem. This is getting crowded down here, so I'm gonna just cheat and move this up here. But we still have a problem. That problem is notice that the voltage-gated potassium channels are still open. And because of that, the cell is hyperpolarizing. If the cell is hyperpolarizing, it's moving farther from the threshold. Okay. So during this point here, and let's switch to my orange highlighter. At this point here, Notice the cell is getting more negative. Now, remind me again, how big of a change did we need originally to get this cell to reach threshold? And again, ignore their numbers, go with my numbers. What do we know? What do we, here, let's actually cheat because I don't like that. A positive 10. There you go, exactly. So I'm gonna totally cheat and put my own number there. Minus 60, perfect. Excellent, so notice at first we needed a positive 10 millivolt change. Switch that to orange, make that a little smaller. That is what we originally needed to reach threshold. All right, we comfortable with that? But look at this point right here. If at this point right here, if we made a 10 millivolt change, would we reach threshold? If we made this cell 10 millivolts more positive than it is right there at that white arrow, would that get us to negative 60 degrees? At next negative 60 millivolts? No. So notice it won't reach threshold. 
with the same stimulus. Now, is it possible to reach threshold? Yes. And when we reach threshold, will those voltage gated sodium channels open? Yes. So we can reach threshold, but it takes a bigger stimulus to reach threshold. But we can reach threshold. We can produce a second action potential. But it's harder to do. And so because of that, this period of time from when those voltage gated sodium channels close to the point where we reach threshold again. No, no, that needs to be orange. To the point where we reach threshold again during this period of time here, we can reach threshold, but to produce a second action potential, it's going to be harder. And so this period of time we call the relative refractory period, because it is relatively harder, but it is not impossible, right? During this first one, it is impossible. During the second period, it is just harder. Now I've made a complete mess of this image, but the good news is that your book does a better job of showing this. So let's jump ahead to this picture. Again, notice from when the door first opens, when we stimulate it and open those voltage gated sodium channels, all the way to the point where we reach threshold coming back down. So we open them, we inactivate them until they close. There is absolutely positively nothing we can do to get a second action potential. So this is called the absolute refractory period. Once the voltage gated sodium channels close, we can open them a second time. The problem is the cell is hyperpolarizing. So while the cell is hyperpolarizing, it is harder to reach threshold. Not impossible. During the absolute refractory period, it is impossible. All right? Impossible Oops. to get a second action potential. During this period, we can get a second action potential, but it takes a greater stimulus. And so this period of time we call the relative refractory period. And then notice once we're back at rest, then the same stimulus that stimulated us the first time would give us an action potential the second time. So the refractory period is over. All right, so notice, just like with the twitch, the refractory period has nothing to do with this action potential and everything to do with when we can produce a second one. All right. Good question. Yes. On the relative uh, refractory period. Yes. Does this start from the peak? No. Uh, all the way down or no? No. The relative refractory period starts when we pass threshold Okay. on the way down. Because at that point, when we pass threshold on the way down, that is when the voltage-gated sodium channels close. And once they, we close the window, then it can be opened again. Okay. All right. Questions on that? All right, excellent. So with that then, we have done everything we need to do about an action potential and talked about our graded potential and where they're produced and how they're produced and everything that goes along with that. Your book's got a nice table that talks about these things a little bit more, so make sure we talked about that. However, our problem is that again, all we've talked about, all the events we've discussed so far, are just occurring at that axon hillock. We still need to be able to propagate that action potential down the axon. And so that is what we are gonna do next. Now that we've produced an action potential, uh, we can need to propagate that action potential.
All right. So to do that, though, it's going to take a little bit more discussion. So let's go ahead and take our second break. It is 1030 now. So we will restart. At uh, 1045 and I will start the recording at that point. So any questions, recording, any questions on that before we take our break? All right, see you guys in 15 minutes then. All righty. We have now produced an action potential, but our goal now is going to be to propagate it. So let's do this again on the board first. I'm pretty sure I saved this, but we'll save it one more time just to make sure, clear that. And start first with our drawing again. Here is our neuron. And I'm just gonna cheat and do it this way. There is our axon. We know there are dendrites. And again, when we propagated our actual potential, we started with a graded potential that was up here. And that graded potential spread down the dendrite, down the cell body to the axon hillock. where we generated our action potential. Our goal now is going to be to propagate that action potential. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this picture and blow it up a little bit. No, nope, hold on, still want it to be black. Oh, this will work. I'll do that. Quick question. Yeah. Uh, what's the difference between the uh, graded potential and the action potential? Remember, graded potentials are small signals that are produced on the cell body and the dendrites that are going to get the cell at the axon hillock to reach threshold. And once we reach threshold, we then produce that uh, voltage. We open voltage gated channels that then produce that big, huge positive signal. Oh, gotcha. Okay. All right, whoops. All right, so here's the cell body. Here's our axon hillock. So rather than writing again, I'll just cheat and draw it here. And again, one of the things we know about the axon that makes the axon special is it has massive amounts of voltage gated sodium and voltage gated potassium channels. All right, so that's one of the things that makes it special. However, which ones are the ones that are responsible for the action potential, the actual big positive signal? Are both of them equally responsible for the big positive signal? No, just the sodium. Right, so what for this part of the process, for propagation, which is again what we're focusing on now, For the propagation of the action potential, we are going to focus solely on the voltage-gated sodium channels. So let's draw a bunch of those. Around the entire length of the axon. So again, there's equally number of voltage-gated potassium channels, but for right now, we are focusing solely on these as the voltage-gated 
sodium channels because those are the ones, oh, that's way too big, uh, because those are the ones that are going to produce the action potential, the big positive signal. And that's what we want to spread. We want to spread that big positive signal. Okay. Now it starts here at the axon hillock. Oh, no, hold on. Shucks. Oh, that's all right. Actually, I don't like that. So these are our voltage gated sodium channels. All right. So right here, graded potential reaches the axon hillock, depolarizes it to threshold, and a massive number of voltage-gated sodium channels open, and we get a huge influx of sodium. There you go. No new information just a reminder of the events that are occurring. We reach threshold and when we reach threshold, that opens our voltage gated sodium channels and we have a massive influx of sodium. And when that occurs, we get our big positive signal we produce an action potential. All right. Now, again, there's no new information here. And we can even take it further. We know that these channels are gonna inactivate, the voltage-gated potassium channels are opening, the cell is gonna repolarize. All those events are going to occur that give us that big, huge action potential that occurs at this location right here where we were measuring it in the trigger zone of our axon hillock. So no new information here, all right? But now's where we start to add so that we can understand how the action potential spreads and not only how it spreads, but also how it self strengthens, right? So the signal never gets weaker, all right? Again, if I produce a wave in a pool, no matter how big that wave is, as it travels, it gets smaller, right? We call that process attenuation. But one of the special things about our action potential is our action potential is that big, huge 100 millivolt change. that 100 millivolt signal. And when it reaches the other end of the axon, it's still a big, huge 100 millivolt signal. It never gets smaller. And since it never gets smaller, that's why it can travel all the way from here to Seattle, Washington. All right, so let's see how this occurs. And it starts with this local effect. This sodium, there's a massive, huge influx of sodium. All of this sodium pours into the cell right here in the axon hillock. And if you had a pitcher of Kool-Aid and in one side of it, you poured in a big, huge, massive uh, spoonful of Kool-Aid mix, would that Kool-Aid mix just stay right there where you, where you poured it into the Kool-Aid pitcher? No it's gonna spread and that's what's gonna happen. We have this massive influx of sodium, but what's gonna happen next is the sodium is gonna spread through the cell. Some of that sodium is going to spread back towards the cell body in the dendrite. Do we care if it spreads back? No, can't really affect anything if it spreads there. But some of it 
is going to spread to the next section of the axon. And when it spreads to the next segment of the axon, we have some positive sodium. These positive ions flowing to the next part of the cell. And when positive ions flow to the next part of the cell, what happens to the next part of the cell? A positive ion moves to this segment of the cell. What happens to this segment of the cell? Gets more positive. This segment depolarizes. Remember, we have a huge 100 millivolt wave coming in. If even a third of it just spreads to the right here, not only is it going to depolarize it, but it's going to depolarize it to threshold. And if we depolarize this segment to threshold, what happens to these voltage-gated sodium channels when we reach threshold? Well, these new voltage-gated sodium channels are going to open. And when these new voltage-gated sodium channels open, new sodium enters into the cell. So we have a massive influx, whoops, new. No. We have a massive influx of sodium in this region right here. And as that new sodium enters into the cell, we get a big positive signal right here at this next location. And when we get that big positive signal, we produce an action potential. We get a big positive signal, a 100 millivolt change that occurs right here at this location. So notice back here, we had a positive 100 millivolt change. And now right here, we have a positive 100 millivolt change. Notice two things. We have moved a small positive signal that open threshold allowed a whole bunch of sodium to came in, come in, and we got a new big positive signal. We've essentially produced a second action potential, a second wave. But if you were looking at this, what it would look like what happened is that the first wave just moved to the right. What it looks like is the action potential has moved from one spot to the next. Now, as it turns out, what we are really doing is producing a small local current. We have a small local current of sodium coming in and then moving. And then this sodium is going to come in and it's going to move as well. So notice what we're doing is we're producing small local currents. But it appears that the action potential is moving and unchanging. And then it's going to happen again. So notice, some of this sodium is going to spread. So let's switch to blue. Some of the sodium is going to come and spread this way. So notice, some sodium spreads back. Does that mean I'm going to get a second action potential at the axon hillock? And it's just going to keep bouncing back and forth to infinity? Well, 
clearly that doesn't sound like a good way for this to work. Ah, bingo, exactly. Some sodium spreads back, but there is no action potential because you're absolutely correct because of the refractory period. Because of the refractory period, there is no action potential behind it. However, these sodium channels haven't been opened, so some sodium spreads to the next section, depolarizes it to threshold, a new voltage, oops, voltage gated sodium channels open, new sodium enters the cell and we get a new action potential at this location. So we reach threshold and as we reach threshold, oops, that threshold, hold on, let's go back to blue there. So again, we reach threshold and our channel's open. And when those voltage-gated sodium channels open, we have a massive influx of sodium. And our action potential has moved again. And again, we get this big, huge 100 millivolt signal. And the process continues. This sodium is going to come in and spread. As it spreads to the next section, it is going to open up new voltage-gated sodium channels. And when those new voltage-gated sodium channels open up, more sodium is gonna come in and we get a big 100 millivolt change, which spreads down the axon. And when it spreads down the axon, that section reaches threshold. And when it reaches threshold, those new channels open and sodium rushes in. And as that sodium rushes in, we get that big positive signal, which then spreads down the, 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 the um, axon. Notice the key to this process, it is a continuous process, step by step, and the signal always stays the same size. We are always letting in more sodium, and as we're letting in more sodium, we're always getting uh, that new action potential that is spreading down. And it looks like it's spreading down continuously, but really it's a bunch of local currents that are being produced. Question? Yes. But sooner or later you run out of sections. So what happens well, then? That is an excellent question. Absolutely, eventually what happens, oops, hold on, let's change the color, is you reach the end of the axon. Hold on, let me move that out of the way. Eventually what happens is you reach the end of the axon and at the end of the axon, there are axon terminals. And at the end of the axon terminal, there is a synaptic M bulb. And when that big action potential reaches the synaptic M bulb, it depolarizes the synaptic M bulb. And what happens when you depolarize the synaptic M bulb? Come on, I know you guys know this. What happens when you depolarize a synaptic M bulb? Voltage-gated calcium channels open. And what happens when voltage-gated calcium channels open?
Calcium end enters the synaptic end bulb. And what happens when calcium enters the synaptic end bulb? All right, vesicles release acetylcholine or whatever neurotransmitter is there, exactly. When that actual potential gets to the end of the axon, then it communicates with the target cell, like using that synapse that we've already talked about. Absolutely. So again, the good news is how a neuron communicates with the target cell is something we've already discussed and you already know. You already know that process. So it's a possible essay question, but you already know the answer to it. In fact, some of you probably had to answer that question on the last exam because it's the exact same process of what we saw at the communication at the neuromuscular junction. All righty, let's look at the pretty pictures from your textbook. Oops, wrong button, that's the one I want. There we go. So here's a slightly nicer drawing than the one I've done, but you get the same idea. This started at our axon hillock at that initial segment. We got that influx of sodium, that big positive signal that gave us our 100 millivolt change to positive 30 millivolts. Some of that sodium spreads to the next section and the next section of the axon reaches threshold. And when it reaches threshold, voltage gated sodium channels open, we get a massive influx of sodium that is then going to get it to reach its action potential. That action potential then leads to the spread. And in this process, step by step, we have this massive signal that spreads down the entire length of the axon. All right. Two implications of this. Let's start with a simple one. One of the questions you guys should already know the answer to, because I'm pretty sure you had to answer this. Now, the way a neuron communicates is it receives a signal here in the cell body and dendrite, and it sends it down the axon. But what would happen theoretically if I took an electrode and I stimulated an axon smack dab in the middle? What would happen in that instance? If I artificially took a neuron and stimulated in the middle, anyone want to hazard a guess what would happen? Would it produce an action potential? Yeah, it should, I think. Yeah, you depolarize it to threshold, voltage-gated sodium channels are gonna open, and at this location right here, you're absolutely gonna get a big, huge, positive 100 millivolt change. But then what would happen? It will travel uh, back and front, and even when it travels back, it will still, uh, uh, it will create action potential because those are still considered new. Perfect, you are absolutely correct. What would happen is indeed, you would actually produce two action potentials that would spread in both directions. Remember, this one didn't spread back because this part was inactive. But if we are artificially stimulating this neuron in the center, you're correct. This segment over here isn't inactive. So you're absolutely correct. When we stimulate it in the middle, you would actually produce two action potentials that would travel in both directions. So really, the way it travels through the axon is just because of the way it's made, the way it functions. If you think about it, it's really not that different from a hose. Water flows one way through a hose. But the reason water flows one way through a hose is because of the attachments at the ends. One attachment attaches to the faucet of the house and the other attaches to the nozzle so you can spray it. But if you cut a hole in a hose and stuck that hole on the faucet, water would easily flow in both directions through both ends of the hose. It's just it's made to only flow one direction because that's how it's connected. And the same thing here. It only flows in one direction because that's how it's set up to function. But if we artificially stimulated it, absolutely, we would get two action potentials go in the other direction. All right, one more implication to this. As we said, it looks like the action potential is traveling. It looks like that wave is traveling down the axon and never getting smaller. 
But as we mentioned, the reason for that is we are producing a ton of local currents. We open voltage-gated sodium channels that allow sodium to enter into the cell. Once the sodium enters into the cell, it has to diffuse down to the next segment. Enough of it has to diffuse where it can reach threshold and open more voltage-gated sodium channels. That allows more sodium to enter into the cell, giving us a big positive signal. Once we produce that big positive signal, some of it has to diffuse. As it diffuses down to the next segment, that segment depolarizes to threshold, opens voltage-gated sodium channels, mass amount of sodium comes in and gets that big depolarization, which is then going to diffuse as well. Notice, when we talked about that electron moving along a wire, an electron moving along the wire basically moves at the speed of light. So like we said, in those old uh, wall phones, we could call grandma in Seattle, Washington, say hello, that signal was carried by an electron uh, from here to Seattle, Washington, and it happens at the speed of light. As I mentioned, if we had an axon that went from here to Seattle, Washington, I could get a signal from here to grandma using an axon. Now, is the same sodium that comes into the first part of the axon here in Sacramento going to be the same sodium ion that reaches grandma in Seattle, Washington? No, because it's local currents, it's not gonna be the same sodium, but it takes a lot of time. And remember, as I mentioned, it would take two days to send an action potential from here to Seattle, Washington. So this is a relatively slow process. Now, again, if it takes two days for that signal to reach from here to Seattle, Washington, how can this possibly function properly in my body? How can I use my nervous system and my axons to communicate when it's that darn slow. How do we do it? Excellent. One way is we can speed it up. Remember, one of the key things we talked about is myelination can speed up our axon. That definitely is, is absolutely something that is useful that way. And again, remember, we could speed it up up to five times faster. So that definitely is useful. However, Five times faster than two days still sounds pretty darn slow. So again, how in the world are we going to, because that's still hours, how can we possibly use a signal that would still take 10 hours to reach Seattle, Washington from here to be able to communicate in our body? Well, we've seen how we can conduct the signal, so we have that. But if it takes 10 hours to reach here to Seattle, Washington, even with myelin, how can we possibly use that in our body? Come on, you guys are overthinking it. All right, let me ask the question this way. How many of you have neurons in your body that are long enough to reach from here to Seattle, Washington? Anyone? No. No. Are your neurons shorter or longer? Shorter. Shorter. Much, much shorter. Right? Instead of having to go hundreds of miles, we have to go a couple feet. So while it is a relatively slow process, it still only takes fractions of a second. Is the communication instantaneously instantaneous? No. There are plenty, and again, I haven't had enough time. To, I used to have a great one. There was a reaction time, um, app's not the right word, but websites you could go to where basically it was a red light and a green light. And when it was on red, you waited for it to hit green. And once you hit green, then you would uh, click the space bar and it would measure how long your reaction time was. A lot of that delay in the reaction time or some of that delay in the reaction time is the time that it takes that action potential from the light stimulating your eyes, seeing that it's turning green, to go to your brain to process that information and then send the signal to your hand so that you can click it. And that's not instantaneous. You can actually measure your reaction time. And so some of that reaction time delay is due to the speed, the slowness of the propagation of that signal. So it is relatively slow, but since we're talking about traveling feet instead of miles, we're talking about fractions of seconds. And so it is very functional. However, as someone already mentioned, that doesn't mean we can't make it faster. And so we can make it faster using myelin.
So we have to see how we can make that faster. All right. So let's take a look at that. Let's go back to our drawing. And I'm just going to wipe this because that's a mess. All right. Well, I don't remember if I saved that. All right. No, I did wrong. Let's just look at the axon here. So there's my axon. There's our cell body. There's our voltage gated sodium channels. All of that is the same as before. However, now what we are going to do is we are going to surround the axon with myelin. So what we have here are hundreds of layers of plasma membrane wrapped around oops, the axon. And remind me again, what cells are it again that produce myelin sheath? Oligodendrocytes in the central nervous system and in the peripheral nervous system, Schwann cells. Excellent. Perfect. So here we have our, actually I'm going to write it here so it's out of my way. Myelination or again our myelin sheath. Excellent. Now remember also we mentioned how the myelin does not cover the axon entirely. There are some spaces, there are some gaps in between and what was the name we gave to these gaps? Excellent, the nodes, perfect. And again, if you want to be fancy, you can call it the node of Ranvier, which again, as I mentioned, is very fun to say. Not as much fun to spell, but so I appreciate why I just want to write nodes. That is perfectly acceptable as well. All righty. One little more bit we need to add to the anatomy. Would it make sense for the cell to have voltage-gated sodium channels and voltage-gated potassium channels here underneath the myelin? Remember, this myelin is made up by a cell of wrapping its plasma membrane hundreds of times around it. So does that mean there's gonna be a lot of sodium there that's gonna be able to leave or a lot of potassium? a place for that potassium to go? No. So there's absolutely no reason to have those channels there. So there aren't any. Instead, where we move our voltage-gated sodium channels and our voltage-gated potassium channels are just to the nodes. So our channels are just located in the nodes. There are no channels located underneath the myelin. All right. Questions on that? All right. Now that we have the anatomy, and I'll let you, hold on, let's just write that just so that we are, these again are voltage gated sodium and voltage gated potassium channels that are going to be located here. The process starts exactly the same as it did before. We start with a graded potential. Uh, from the cell body or the dendrite, it travels to the axon hillock. It depolarizes it to threshold. Our voltage gated, oops, Sodium channels open, 
we get a massive influx of sodium and we get reduce our action potential. Again, absolutely positively nothing new. The beginning of this process is exactly the same. We have that graded potential. That graded potential spreads to the axon hillock. We reach threshold. When we reach threshold, those voltage gated sodium channels open. We have a massive influx of sodium and we produce a big, huge, oops, 100 millivolt signal. Absolutely, positively, nothing is different. Right? Influx of sodium. So, so far, everything is the same. Now, again, just like before, we get this influx of sodium and some of the sodium spreads down the axon. So again, we are going to get a spread of sodium down the axon. But notice this time, it's going under the myelin sheath, and it can not open new channels, primarily because there's no new channels there. What this means is that it spreads, but it spreads passively, kind of like that wave in the pool. I produce a wave in a pool, and that wave spreads passively. I'm not adding new, any new energy, any new uh, you know, sodium to that. And what happens to our wave as it spreads down the pool? As a wave spreads down the pool, what happens to that wave? It gets weaker. It gets weaker, absolutely, it gets smaller. So as it spreads passively, the signal gets smaller or I like your term, weaker. We have a fancy name for this. We say the signal attenuates. Attenuates means exactly that. What happens is the signal gets smaller. The wave gets smaller. So the size of the wave It's small. All right. So the good news is it's faster. We're not having to open new channels and let more things in. So this is a faster process. We've traveled faster more quickly, but the signal gets weaker. However, if you think about it, it started as a 100 millivolt signal. How big a signal do we actually need? How big of a signal do we actually need at this node? Here I've got voltage gated channels. If I want to do something with these voltage gated channels, what do I have to get to? I only have to get to threshold, absolutely. But we only need to reach threshold. And how big of a signal do we need for that? Well, we need to get to negative 60, but we started at negative 70. So we only need a positive 10 signal. So notice, our signal could attenuate as much as 90%. We could lose 90% of our signal, but as long as we reach threshold, whoops, hold on, I want that to be red. This can then be green. As long as we reach threshold, our voltage gated sodium channels will open, new uh, sodium rushes in, 
and we produce a second big positive signal, a second action potential. And so right here at this location, we produce, right, we reach threshold, those channels open, we have a massive influx of sodium, and again, we produce a big positive 100 millivolt signal. Of course, that signal spreads. And as it spreads, it attenuates. But as long as it reaches threshold at the node, the process will continue. So as long as we still get a big enough signal to that node to reach threshold, then what happens once we reach threshold there is again, we will open those, whoops, nope, blue. Cheat, put that over there. We will open those voltage gated sodium channels. We get an influx of sodium and we get another big positive signal. much, much faster process. In fact, they have a fancy name for this process. The fancy name for this process, and we'll write it big to make sure we understand it, is it is saltatory conduction. Saltatory conduction actually means jumping because it looks like the action potential is jumping from node to node to node. So they call this saltatory conduction. Let's look at the pretty picture from your textbook that shows the same thing. Again, here we have our illustration of our myelinated axon with the nodes in between. Notice we have that influx of sodium. It spreads under the myelin, but again, as it spreads, it is going to attenuate. The signal gets smaller. Like the waves of a pool, it spreads quickly, but it attenuates as it travels. But as long as it reaches this threshold, when we reach threshold, it is gonna open more channels. We get another action potential produced here, and that one spreads. And another one's produced there, and that one spreads, and so on and so forth. And so in this fashion, with our myelin, we get our saltatory conduction. We get our jumping of our action potential from node to node. Again, it can speed it up up to five times as quickly as just a normal unmyelinated axon. And so even when you're just going a couple feet, that can make a huge difference. Notice again, and we've talked about it already, but that means that this myelin is super duper important. Does that mean, but if it's super duper important, can we go back a slide for a couple seconds uh, to that one? Oh, the whiteboard, yeah, sure. So this is super important it speeds up the action potential up to five times faster. But as I already mentioned, not every axon is myelinated. Some axons are unmyelinated. One example of that is your pain pathway. Does that make a lot of sense? If you touch something hot, the axon that carries that information to your brain to let you know you're touching something hot is unmyelinated. If you're touching something hot, don't you want to know you're touching something as hot as soon as possible? Yeah. So why use the slower axon? Why use the unmyelinated axon? Why might our pen pain pathway not be myelinated?
Anyone want to hazard a guess? Did y'all fall asleep on me? Well, uh, possibly that might be one way, but notice here's the key. As long as we reach threshold, right? As long as we reach threshold, as long as the signal is big enough, right? As long as we can reach threshold, it's gonna be big enough. And that's the key. Part of the problem is we are relying on uh, the properties of the myelin to make sure that it insulates. Really, so the insulating, let's say it this way, insulation properties of the myelin to get that signal to spread. If theoretically something happened to the myelin, if the myelin uh, was damaged or part of it was removed, what would happen is that the signal could attenuate too quickly. And if the signal attenuated too quickly, so that when you reach that next node, the size of the signal was, and again, let's just say for argument's sake, was only a plus nine millivolt change. What would happen when we reach this node? It will end there. Yeah. If it's not big enough, we can't open the gated channels and the action potential stops. So notice there is a risk with the system. So while a pain pathway may be a teeny bit slower, it's reliable. That signal's always getting through. Whereas here, there's the potential if there's a problem with the myelin, that signal might not get through. And if that signal can't get through, then you don't know you're in pain and that's a problem. Now, luckily, there really isn't anything that destroys the myelin in your body. All right, there's no such thing as something that uh, maybe produces many cracks in your myelin sheath. Luckily, there's no kind of condition like that that actually exists in the real world. All right. Yes, no, maybe. Well, we have the drugs, right? Well, uh, sure, yeah, absolutely. And we will talk about toxins that can affect this. What I'm saying is there is, luckily there is no medical condition where you produce many cracks or even multiple cracks within your myelin sheath that could affect your, abil your ability to send action potentials in your central nervous system. Uh, is there something that has a name? Something with, about those multiple cracks or multiple sclerosis? There you go. Multiple sclerosis is indeed a autoimmune disorder. And in that autoimmune disorder, what actually happens is that your own immune cells target and destroy the myelin in your central nervous system. So remind me again, what cells would that be affecting? Oligodendrocytes. Excellent, that would be affecting your oligodendrocytes. So what happens is your own immune cells in your body target and destroy it. It can lead to visual deficits, uh, motor deficits, all sorts of different things can happen with multiple sclerosis as a result of this destroying of the myelin sheath. Absolutely, so yes, unfortunately, uh, there are things that can actually uh, modify that, right? But there are other things that can modify it as well, some simple things, right? Baseball is right around the corner, maybe. They'll be playing baseball again. Maybe they're not. Who knows? But let's pretend for argument's sake that baseball is being played. And let's say for argument's sake, you're playing baseball. There you are at home plate. 
right? Full count, nobody on base, and the pitcher beans you in the arm with the baseball. What do you do as a result of that? You get hit in the arm with the baseball, what do you do? Grab your arm. Right, exactly, right? Okay, and of course, all right, it, yeah, you get to go to first base, absolutely, and because if you're playing baseball, you're all man, you just have to stare them down as you go over there, but you're right, what you really want to do is you want to rub your arm. Why do you want to rub your arm when you get hit in the arm by a baseball? Make the pin go away? Yeah, it feels better, doesn't it? Right? Here's what I recommend. Next time you're walking around the house and you see someone that you love, what I want you to do is punch them really hard in the arm. All right? Don't let them know it's coming. Right? Just punch them really hard in the arm. And what you'll see is they will rub it. And the reason they rub is that it feels better. The reason it feels better is because obviously you have nerves there sending a signal to your brain telling you that you are feeling pain. But when you rub the skin, the tactile sensory uh, neurons in there produce a larger signal and send that larger signal to the brain. And when they send that larger signal to the brain, they actually mask the pain signal. And so your brain, your brain doesn't perceive the pain signal. Of course, the problem is as soon as you stop running your arm, what happens? It hurts again. Absolutely. So is there anything else you can do then if your arm's hurting? Well, maybe you can take some type of anesthetic and rub it on there, right? Something like a lidocaine. You put that lidocaine on there. True, ice reduces the inflammation. The ice reducing the inflammation, inflammation pushes on the nerves and causing pain. So ice reduces the swelling so there's less pain that way. That is more of a longer term solution. Notice when you're putting the ice on it, it feels better not just because the ice is reducing the swelling, but you're also putting pressure and that pressure is uh, masking the signal. But the other thing you could do is you could put on a lidocaine patch or rub in a lidocaine ointment. What lidocaine does is it blocks the voltage gated sodium channels so that the signal doesn't get through. Or maybe instead of getting punched in the arm, maybe now that some dentist office are open, maybe you're getting a root canal. And when they do that root canal, they have to, or filling a cavity or something like that, they don't want you to feel the pain of the drill. So they inject Novocaine. That Novocaine blocks the voltage gated signal. So the pain signal from the tooth never gets to your brain and you don't feel the pain sensation. You still feel the pressure, right? Because it doesn't always block that signal, but typically it blocks the pain. And so tactile sensation. So you're all numb and you talk funny for the next day. Or maybe instead, if you're really, really adventurous, you can go to a really fancy sushi restaurant, not in the United States. And again, then you have to leave the United States. Nobody's letting us leave. But back in ancient times, you used to be able to leave. Uh, you used to be able to do this in Canada. I don't know if Canada still allows it. But if you go to a super fancy uh, a sushi restaurant in uh, Japan, or like I said, it used to be in Canada, although I don't know if it's still the case in Canada, you can get a very special dish called fugo. Anyone know what fugo is? Fugo it's, is... It's, it's not this poisonous fish, is it? It is indeed. It is indeed that puffer fish. Absolutely. It is specially prepared puffer fish. Again, you used to be able to do this in Canada. I don't know if it's still the case. It is illegal in the United States, but it used to be legal in Canada. The uh, sushi, let's try that again. The sushi chefs that prepare it need to be relicensed every six months. So every six months they have to go through the licensing process again. Uh, you still have to, when you have it, sign a waiver saying that you are uh, you, you know, acknowledging the risk of what you are doing and not gonna hold the restaurant responsible for that when you sign that. And the goal of this Fugo is to get a little piece of puffer fish. Puffer fish have a special toxin, uh, a bladder filled with a special toxin, and that toxin is called tetrodotoxin. Tetrodotoxin, or what is abbreviated TTX, is a very powerful voltage-gated sodium channel blocker. 
So the key is when they prepare the puffer fish, it has just enough of that toxin in it so that when you pick it up with your fingers, you get a tingling sensation of your fingers. When you put it in your mouth, you get a tingling sensation to your tongue and to your lips, but not so much to tototoxin that it gets into your bloodstream and, oh, I don't know, stops your heart or stops or, or, or paralyzes your uh, respiratory uh, muscles so that you can't breathe or some of those things. You know, something like a half dozen people a die every year uh, from improperly prepared uh, pufferfish fugo. Uh, and again, like I said, it's completely illegal in the United States. Used to be available in Canada. I don't know if it still is, but it's still available in other countries as well. Because again, everybody's got to get their thrills one way or another. So this is one of those things, example of this. Tetrodotoxin is a very, very powerful voltage-gated sodium channel blocker that when it gets in the bloodstream can last for days. So again, you stop those voltage-gated sodium channels, you stop the action potential from getting where it needs to go. All right, questions on that? Yeah, I just got a kind of like a weird question. You know, sometimes like um, you, you get hurt or you get scratched or you have a bruise, but you don't even know how you got it. How, how does that how does that happen do you know well usually for me it's my wife that causes those <laughs> um no uh, so uh, uh, all kidding aside what i would say is that there are a couple things and and i think our our, our perception of pain is one of the least understood systems because there's it's a very hard system to study however i think often seeing it in its purest form and in that case, what I mean is little kids, is a great example of that. If you have a one-year-old who is learning to walk and they are standing up and they're holding their balance and they slam down to the ground, do you rush over there and like fuss all over them and make a big deal about the fact that they fell down? No. No. Yes, I agree with Madison. It is absolutely terrifying when that happens, but do you rush over there and let them know that you're terrified? No, you try to let them kind of figure it out. And right, usually because <laughs> if you make a big deal out of it, then they make a big deal out of it. Yeah, if they definitely just, are. If you just tell them, oh, good job there, buddy, shake it off, and they don't think it's a big deal, then they don't get as upset, right? It's always great, like a kid falls, and it, you watch these with little kids that fall, and the first thing they'll do is look around to see if anybody noticed. Yeah. If anybody yeah. noticed, they'll cry. If no one noticed, then they just go on with what they're doing. So part of it is our perception. It is off, there are things that we may do where you brush up against something and maybe you're paying attention to something else where you're able to do enough damage that you may have broken some blood vessels and gotten a bruise as a result of it, uh, but you may not necessarily be aware of it. So some of it could be those things that they're just more subtle things that are happening and you're just not attending to it. And because you're not attending of it, you're not as aware of it. Okay, got you, thanks. Yep. All righty. Excellent. So there you go. With that, that is everything we wanted to cover from a, oh God, brutal. Um, so that is everything I wanted to cover from a lecture standpoint. All right. We don't have a lot of time to get into the anatomy. So I think I'm going to save most of the anatomy for next time, but I do want to talk a little bit about some of the basic stuff on our list. So let's do that. Um, so any questions on this before we finish our action potential? We've produced an action potential, we have propagated an action potential without myelin, and we've propagated an action potential with myelin, and now we've even talked away about ways that we can modify an action potential. Clearly, there's all four things that are potential essay questions, so make sure you're comfortable and familiar with this information. So any questions on this uh, before we um, move forward? All right, what I want to do then is first this. We started our introduction to the brain anatomy in the last one, how we talked about there are these five cephalons that we're going to use to 
uh, to uh, discriminate the different regions of the brain, the brain anatomy. Uh, and notice here we see those uh, uh, five uh, cephalons in their mature state, color-coded from those. But the other thing that I want to talk about for the brain anatomy is there's going to be different regions to within these. Basically, what we are going to be talking about are two different types of things. The first are going to be structures, and the second are going to be regions or areas. A structure, just like the name seems to indicate, is a physical component. If it is just a physical characteristic, right, then does it really have a specific function? No, it's just a physical component. Regions or areas are basically collections of cell bodies and dendrites, and they are going to have a specific function. Let's see some simple examples of these. Notice as you look at the cerebrum here, there are all these nooks and crannies to these, all these raised ridges and these indented grooves. The reason for this is size. Remember, as we've talked about, we hold the silver medal for relative brain size to the size of our body, right? Dolphins are the ones that actually win. They have the gold, but we get the silver and second place is okay, right? One of the reasons we're able to get so much in the brain is rather than having all of our cell bodies and dendrites in one big flat sheet, we crumple it up into a ball so it makes much less space. And that's what we see here. I'm gonna cheat and get rid of this. So I can cheat and do a little drawing on my own. So again, notice what we have is we have these raised ridges and these grooves in between. So these red, raised ridges have a name. The raised ridge is something we call on the cerebrum, the gyrus. And the groove, the indentation, we refer to as the sulcus. So we have a gyrus, we have a sulcus. The plural gyri, the plural sulci. As you'll see, and you see it in this illustration here, in some instances, the sulcus is really, really deep. If the sulcus is really, really deep, they give that a special name and a really, really deep sulcus we call a fissure. Now, if we've learned anything is that as anatomists hate us, and notice if you look here at the cerebellum, on the cerebellum, notice the cerebellum also has some ridges and grooves to them. So again, this over here is for the cerebrum and its anatomy. But, and since they've got blue, let's go ahead and change to blue. The cerebellum has ridges and grooves as well. It doesn't have any fissures, but it does indeed have some grooves, and sure enough, those grooves are called sulci, or again, the singular being sulcus. That means, very conveniently as it is, the raised ridge of the cerebellum must also be called a gyrus, right? Nope, anatomists hate us. So the raised ridge of the cerebellum are called the folium, or folio, hold on. Folium, or folia being the plural. 
because they think it looks like the foliage ends of ends the ruffled edges of a leaf. All of these things are structures. These structures in and of themselves don't necessarily have any inherent functions. We just have, right, this is a gyrus, 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 this is a folium, this is a folium, this is a folium, this is a folium, this is a sulcus, 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 this is a sulcus. Just structures. All right. Now, that doesn't mean that some of these structures don't have names. In fact, if you look closely, and let's actually look at a different picture like this one. Uh, here we go. Notice our cerebrum is divided into two main hemispheres, a left hemisphere and a right hemisphere. And that occurs based on a big deep fissure in between the two hemispheres known as the longitudinal fissure that goes down the midline of the body. But while we're here, I want you to notice one other feature as well. Notice starting right here at the very top of the brain, there is a predominant obvious groove that goes both to the left and to the right. This groove is what is known as the central sulcus. The sulcus, like all sulci, are between gyri. So notice this, oops, no, no. This gyrus here is the gyrus right in front of the central sulcus. And the gyrus right in front of the central sulcus we call the pre central gyrus. And this sulcus is right behind, pardon me, this gyrus is right behind the central sulcus. So guess what we call it? The post-central gyrus. Now, the central sulcus is pretty easy to find. It starts at the top of the head and works its way down, but Again, one of my goals in this class is to make it as easy as possible for you to understand this information. So notice here, we have these nice color-coded pictures uh, of your brain. And notice here, they have emphasized much more clearly our central sulcus, our pre-central gyrus, and our post-central gyrus. So many of the images that I'll use on the exam will be images like this that make it easier for you to identify the structures. Notice one last big structure that you see here color coded. There are four and a half uh, lobes to our cerebrum. And luckily, we learn the bones. You learn them once, you get to use them twice. The frontal bone covers a portion of the brain known as the frontal lobe. The temporal bone covers a portion of the brain known as the temporal lobe. The parietal bone covers a portion of the brain known as the parietal lobe. And the occipital bone covers a portion of the brain known as the occipital lobe. So these lobes, these gyri, these sulci, all of these are structures that you are responsible for identifying. However, this particular region of cells has a specific function, and this particular region of cells have a specific function. There are neurons there, they produce action potentials, but their functions are very, very different. 
Remember, one of the things we said about our brain is we have specialization. What happens in one location is different from what happens in another location. And we also have lateralization. Sometimes what happens in one area on the left is different from what happens on the other area in the right. So we are going to look at the gray matter. And notice if we switch to, where's the picture that I want? This one, there we go. Notice here, we see the gray matter forming the gyri, forming the sulci. And again, remember, as we mentioned, this gray matter is the cell bodies and dendrites. These form the regions or areas. That also have specific functions. The white matter is predominantly made of myelinated axons. And those are just the pathways of information from one location to another. Here in the central nervous system, gray matter forms the superficial layer, what is known as the cerebral cortex, whereas the deep part is the white matter. And that white matter forms what we call tracks. However, notice there are these pink and red and purple things in here. Within the white matter, there are clusters of cell bodies. And those clusters of cell bodies we refer to as a nucleus. Nucleus being singular, plural being nuclei. Remember, this is different from in the peripheral nervous system. Remember, the peripheral nervous system, our axons form our nerves and our cell bodies oops, form ganglia. Again, we are behind in this class. As I mentioned to you before, I have posted the link directly to my histology review for the nervous system. I strongly, strongly, strongly encourage you to take a look at that because I don't know how much of that we will actually get to in the class together ourselves. So it is vitally important that you look at that stuff and make sure that you understand that because you definitely are gonna be responsible for it. So I don't know how much time I'll have in class. We gotta make sure we get through the lecture uh, so some of the lab may suffer and that histology is going to be vitally important because it's a huge part of this class. So we are going to start talking about regions. We're going to start talking about these structures. We're going to go through your list. You have a gross anatomy of the nervous system list. That gross anatomy of the nervous system list, the spinal cord, and the histology associated with it is going to be 50% of your lab exam. 50% of your lab exam is going to be a spinal cord and brain anatomy. The other 50% is going to be a combination of uh, the autonomic nervous system, the cranial nerves, and if there's time, sensory stuff. But it doesn't look like there's going to be too much time for sensory stuff. So that means 25% cranial nerves, 25% autonomic nervous system. That's your breakdown for the lab exam. So if you haven't started looking at this stuff already, first and foremost, shame on you. But secondly, make sure you get started. All right. Since we're behind, I'm going to leave us at this point, and what we are going to do at the beginning of class tomorrow is we're actually going to start in lab. We're going to start by going over the brain anatomy and start working through this list so we can get through this list and see how far we get. And then from there, we'll go into the lecture component. All right. Uh, I think at that point, this is all I wanted. This is as far as I wanted to get today. I know we've covered a lot of material. We still have a lot to go, but I think this is a good stopping point. So any questions on any of this before we call it a day?
Yeah, I just have a random question. Um, sure. You know how they say that, I, I don't know if you're sure or not, but I heard that we only use like, I don't know, 10% of our brain or something like that. Is that actually true or is it just a myth? No, it's a, it's, it's a misconception. Uh, that, at any one particular time, as you're sitting resting in a, you know, in a chair, zoning out, watching TV or something like that, only 10% of your brain may be active. But, uh, but again, when you're actively doing things far more than that is, and again, what parts of the brain you're using depend completely on the activities. If you're listening to music, if you're watching TV, if you're reading a book, if you're, you know, uh, talking to somebody, you're using different parts of your brain. So no, that's, that's, that, that is an inaccuracy. We use all parts of your brain. You're nervous. In fact, Again, probably the classic example of this is that you have parts of your brain that are associated with touch. So if I lose my hand in a horrible industrial accident, there's going to be a part of my brain that was receiving sensory information from my hand that isn't getting any information anymore. So does that part of your brain just stay silent forever at that point? No. You may not have thought of it in those terms, but that's prime real estate. And what'll start to happen is other parts of your body will actually grow into that area. How do we know that? Well, because as it starts to do that, some of that rewiring of that tissue may be partially incomplete. So what happens is I ru someone rubs me on my chin and I feel that they're rubbing me on my chin, but I also feel that they're rubbing me on my hand that isn't there anymore. What do we call that condition? When I feel someone rubbing my hand, even though my hand's not there, we call it a phantom limb, exactly. Many of those phantom limb symptoms are by incomplete or uh, not fully rewired organization of that tissue. Other areas grow into that tissue. Nervous system is super, super, super prime real estate. And if those neurons aren't being used for something, someone else is gonna steal those neurons to use them. So we have this ability to reform and reorganize our nervous tissue, especially in kids. Kids' minds are so incredibly plastic. Right. As adults, we're all pretty much ruined at this point. We're, 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 you know, we're, we're toast at this point. But again, that those newborn babies, those one to two year olds, uh, they can learn four different languages and all sorts of amazing things that they can learn at that age because their brains are so much more plastic. We're more limited on what we can do, uh, but we still have some plasticity in our brain. And so, yeah, the, 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 the fact that you would, that the fact that, 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 that there would be large portions of the brain that aren't being used uh, would be such an incredible waste of real estate. So yeah, so absolutely, we use all parts of our brain at all different times. But yeah, that is a very, very common misperception you hear about all the time, but completely inaccurate. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent question. Any others? All right, then that is all I have for you today. We get to finish a little bit early. So excellent. So uh, rest up. We got a busy day ahead of us tomorrow. So uh, start looking at this material if you haven't already. Uh, start working on your, uh, what do you have due tomorrow? Tomorrow you have your uh, unit review due. So again, working with the nervous tissue. Uh, start looking at that physio X, get all those other things, and I will see you tomorrow. All right. Be happy, be safe, be healthy. See you tomorrow.